Hey everybody, we are back for one more. So I actually calculated it. We've done over 23 hours uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the Arkansas trip and we haven't left Colorado. So, but there, there was a, there's a, there's a, there, there is a, there is a logic here. There's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a reason. There's a reason for the season. Um, so the, so you, we, we spent a lot of time kind of, you know, building up to the, our trip. And I think, like you said, Allison, you know, this will move a lot faster as we start to go through some of these, these dots of this, this map that you made. Uh, but some of them were very long. And one of them in particular was, was this one we just finished up last week, which was on synchronicity. And, yeah. and so, uh, you know, a lot of really interesting things happened to us on our trip, uh, synchronistically, uh, speaking that aligned with the work that we've been doing. And so, um, and we, I'm like, I, we're not totally a synchronous, like, it's not like synchronistic things happen to me all the time. You know, this is it like, it was notable, like noticeable to the point yeah. of like, oh, you need to pay attention to what's actually going on here. Right. Yeah, I agree. It was definitely not your, your, your typical everyday synchronicity that we, they were very specific things that happened. And we, and I, so far we've talked about the, the hiker coming through and the, the, um, the, the climate, uh, nonlinear climate research Here's, that he does yeah. and the horns, you know, there's the horns yeah. and all of that. So, um, yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting and, uh, you know, like the Alice in Wonderland thing that kept popping up and, you know, the, the, it was definitely, it was, it was a definitely a curious, a curious adventure. But, um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that going through a lot of these different things where, where, you know, these synchronicities. Because there were two it, days in a row, like this is going to seem very distant because we've spent like, there's like 10 hours between the first one and the second one, but literally on the trip, there were two days. And so the first day we're in the park next to Cheyenne mountain and the nonlinear dynamic systems modeling guys shows up. And then the second day, which we're going to talk about today. Um, so then the very next day we. Um, are at a very remote National Park Service historic site in the middle of like Eastern Colorado. And there's like a strange synchronicity that happens at that point too. And so it was like, if it had only been one, you, we might not have really made it such a big deal about it, but it was these two very specific things back to back. And it kind of unfolded for me, this idea that, that built into a lot of the work that we did right before the trip was around um, Michael Matias and the gaming, the social gaming, and um, this idea of Jungian archetypes and social gaming and how that might fit into socio-technical computing. And then, you know, backing event in eventually into this like many worlds theory and quantum superposition, like particle wave stuff, which well, I guess we'll talk a little bit about particle wave stuff today, but that sculpture. And so it really, anyway, we needed to, I feel like we needed to frame out some of these ideas so that when we talked about them, they would be meaningful, but it's a lot of new territory. And again, it's a little bit challenging because I don't come at things from an esoteric framing. That's not like, again, people who know me, the door I came in with public education, but things show up and then like, whether it's high level physics or certain sort of esoteric practices that they're right there. So if you don't look at them and at least explore what's going on, then to me, you're doing a disservice to the project. You have to actually look when they shove it in your face. Well, a lot of this too is just paying attention. And and like, even on this trip, some of the synchronicities, I don't know if I would have like made the connection had you not brought it up. Like once you brought it up, I was like, oh yeah, that is kind of weird. But me, me like even the, the hiker coming up, like, oh, I was like, oh, that was an interesting guy. Like I wouldn't have like, connected it to like what we're talking about and what we're doing. Like, uh, it wasn't like my brain doesn't like work like that. I don't like automatically yeah. think I'm starting to a little bit more, I think just from yeah. being around you. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the information field, <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. Like we're, we're, we're swimming in this, in this, in this environment, in this field or whatever. And, and you don't necessarily always notice all these things. And one of the funny things about burning man, uh, just if I can, 
yeah. you to bring that up is that's one of the things that everyone likes to talk about at Burning Man is there's all these really weird synchronicities that happen. And maybe mm-hmm. these, maybe they're happening in our lives all the time and we just don't notice them. And then, the uh, but then like when you're at Burning Man, you're, you're, you're kind of, there's this, the, the narrative is going around like, oh yeah, weird stuff happens at Burning Man. So like a couple synchronistic stories that I have at Burning Man, why well, uh, there's three of them. I don't know if I'll tell all three, but, uh, like one of them, one of the stories was crazy, uh, and and we could we may not even include this. I don't know. If it's we'll, we'll see. But the, the, my friend, uh, she had lost her bicycle. There's all these bicycles, and people go out to the clubs, and you just park your bike, and you know, some people lock them up. A lot of people don't. But sometimes people pick up your bike. There are actual thieves there, and then there are people that are just like drunk and they they just grab a bike and they ride off they ride off with it (laughs) anyways it wasn't a very expensive bike um but she she liked it had little kitty ears on it or whatever she had it all decorated or whatever and she lives in san francisco and so she lost her bike at burning man and then uh she 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 posted a thing on the um on one of the forums for Burning Man, like, hey, I lost my bike. This is what it looks like. If anybody knows anything, let me know. Someone reached out to her and said, um, uh, hey, our friends in Colorado have your bike. They, they they ended up with your bike. And and she goes, oh, that's perfect. My friend, uh, I have a friend in Colorado that's about to drive mm-hmm. out. So a friend of mine that lives here who, who I camp with. Uh, was about to leave to go to San Francisco just right at that moment so that she gives the guy the, the uh, she gives my friend the number of the person that has her bike and he's like okay great I'll pick it up where do you live and the, the person gives the address they literally live next door <laughs> what do you and, and we're like wait what like how how like how is that even possible like how is and, like even to this day I'm just like what the person that has your bike lives next door to my friend who's headed out to San Francisco right now. So like all these weird things. And like, there's, you know, there's, uh, there was some other things where like, I was like needing, I was like, Oh, I was, I got in my car and the person I was supposed to drive back with ended up leaving early, but she needed me to bring her to grab her stuff, but I didn't have enough gas money to get back home. So it was like the last day of burning man. So I was, I got on my, my truck to go to her camp to get her stuff. And then my, my friend, Eric, who I'd been hanging out with jumps in the car. And I tell this long story about like what happened with her and why she left early. And now I need to find someone to get a ride. Uh, Cause I don't have enough gas money to get home. And, and then like, after me spending like 15 minutes telling the story, he goes, <laughs> well, I just ran out. I just left my camp to go try to find someone that could give me a ride back to Denver. <laughs> oh. So there's, those are just two little stories, but there's a bunch of little, little weird things that happen that are like synchronous. And you're like, but you, you know, you go through life and these things happen and you never really stop and think about it. You're like, wait a minute. Like, wh- what are the odds of that? Or like how, you know, I think a lot of synchronicities happen and we don't even notice them. You know, Mm -hmm. but then some of them are just so glaring that you just can't not notice them. Well, and sometimes it seems like when you're out of your ordinary situation, right? Like we were, this trip was out of an ordinary situation. And obviously Burning Man is that they call, they they go like, everybody complain. They go like, oh, I got to go back to the default world. That's what people say when they're at Burning Man. They're like, you know, Mm -hmm. why can't this, you know, we, we have this experience, this type of experience in the real world, you know, the default world or whatever. So yeah, it's being outside of your your element. Yeah, exactly. So so it's sort of like we're having this interaction with the environment or the field or what have you. And and that that's again, I you know, I go back and forth. I'm not always like super cheerful. I've had like tricky things the last, you know, it's like ups and downs, but I feel like if we can hold on to some of the playfulness about it or practice, it's not my default space. There's a lot of people who are far more playful, like you're more playful than I am. I'm like, tend to be like very serious and do the work and all this stuff. And I need to work on that. Like that's part of my own personal work. But if you can get into the groove of that sort of, hmm, like magical realism thing, like I feel like there's some energy in the system that like, if what you're able to see is not like scary, like for me, these things weren't scary. They were just interesting. Like, hmm, that's interesting. Like, oh, there you go. Trickster energy or magical realism. Like. It, it feels conducive. So um, anyway. Yeah. Well, and just- also too, the way you approach it, like having the playful thing and having, being a little bit like, oh, that's interesting. It, it I think it, it can serve you in just your mental health. Like I know, have the, you know, having a certain attitude about things has saved me from, you know, like, yeah, I, I've gotten down about 
how the world is. But like, honestly, like with all the stuff I know about the world, I'd probably be a complete basket case yeah. if, if, if I, if I didn't have the playfulness and the humor and all of that, you know? So exactly. So yeah, so the synchronicity piece is important and I've actually been working on, you know, we, we started the fascia conversation and I have like another big map that I'm working on that links like essentially schizophrenia or like many worlds theory and lipids and um, all sorts of like Norse mythology and, you know, cryptocurrency and soulbound tokens like into this maniac television series from Netflix in 2018. And like, it's interesting to see the extent to like, again, playing around with these ideas of potentiality and many worlds theory and choice architectures. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to hold that in an esoteric space, but I think on the other hand, to understand the idea of these protocol layers and the information fields, like to me at this point, like holding the concepts of token engineering and understanding that there's sort of a field created in, in the exchange of these tokens, like the signals intelligence itself is creating its own energetic field. That's probably piggybacking on groups that already have their own certain level of like collective understanding. Like, you know, when you're in a group and you're like in the same groove with people, like that's natural. And then you've got tokens that are being exchanged. And that's like another layer on top of that for either steering or co-opting, siphoning off information. And, and then you, you link it to Levin, which is the morphic fields and embryology and building something, right? And then you attach it to the, you know, voting reforms and new democracy, which is like building this super organism that we are agents or slash cells in this super organism. And then potentially all of these fields, because Julius Schulman, his shtick was fields within fields within fields, right? You know, he was working foundation for integrated education with theosophists is that these fields themselves may ultimately extend beyond our sensing. Like, so we have, like our biology keeps us in what we understand as reality, the story of what we're living in, right? The, everything that we can see and touch and smell and, and the energies we feel with each other and, and the, the physicality of things. But I believe that's not all there is because like we know within the range of sight, there's a lot of stuff we can't see. Within the range of sound, there's a lot of stuff we can't hear. If we could dial into these, and we have tools, we build tools to access those big telescopes and microscopes and different sensing mechanisms. But th that's all part of this complex artifact kind of thing. But I feel like the next phase is, and this is what we were talking about here some, is this an interdimensional space. Like, and, and what is that? Is that spiritualism is that quantum physics like and i don't know like i haven't dialed it in i mean i think a lot of people are like oh it's you know it's the pleiadians like and i'm not that like that's a whole other crew of people doing their own thing but like that's not the door i come in so when people are like oh great you're doing esoteric stuff now i'm like not exactly <laughs> like i'm kind of carving well, out my own way of doing things and it, it involves like biophysics and econophysics and now a side, a side dose of like possible parapsychology. <laughs> yeah. Well, my approach is, is like, I think it's interesting and fun to explore the air, the, the, these, all these different areas and, and to, to um, maybe theorize and kind of question like, well, you know, what, it, what could it, could it be this? Could it be that? It's kind of fun to explore that space. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm a little more, uh, like I, I'm okay with not actually settling on this is what it is. You know what I mean? I'm okay with. Well, it's a moving oh. target. I mean, I think we've been <laughs> moving through a lot of, a lot of spaces. I mean, honestly, yeah. I think our journey, um, like since you showed up in my living room, like in the summer of 2020, like we've probably moved through at least four major like conceptual spaces at this point. Like, yeah. Yeah. For sure. You know, impacts and tokens and you know, game mechanics and well, you know, I have this idea. I, I think I may have talked about this before, but my Mad Libs theory that I came mm -hmm. up with. So Mad okay. Libs, Mad Libs is uh, did did you did you have Mad Libs when you were a kid? Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a it's a book with a story, but a bunch of the words are missing, and so it'll, and you go through it, and it'll say put a noun here, put an adjective here, yeah. whatever, and then and then you read it back, and it's just a silly story, and everybody laughs, 
Um, so I came up with my Mad Libs theory. Uh, you know, it was really like looking at religion because I was like, oh, people would like, oh, this is what happened. You know, because I pondered when I was younger, when I was in high school, like what happens to you after you die and everything like this. And I used to think about questions and I realized like, I'm probably never going to have the answers to the questions and that's okay. I don't necessarily need to know what happens, you know, after I die, if anything. Um, and, and, but I was thinking about that, like we as a species, we can't leave those things blank. Like we have a hard time um, with saying, mm -hmm. I don't know. And so like, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, in scientific terms or religious terms, we've got to fill those things in. We just can't leave it blank. And so I realized like, I'm okay with leaving the, leaving the blanks blank. If, if they're genuinely blank for me, like, I'm like, I don't know, maybe it's that, maybe it's this, this is interesting, but that doesn't yeah. mean I can't explore those things. I've got the pin board. That's my approach. <laughs> <laughs> just like, get in it, yeah. the string, and go see her, go see her, you know? Um, yeah. But it's interesting about the stories, what you say, because like one of the dots I was putting yesterday from the Maniac series, it was sort of like, and, and I'm not great with all of the philosophizing, but like Eastern mysticism, this idea of, you know, like everything is a whole and you're you, like, you don't have your own identity per se. And like, I came across an article that was again, like Western science meets Eastern, you know, philosophy. Just like, oh yes, like we figured out if you sever the two sides of the brain, like, you know, you have the part that does the physicality stuff and then you have the part that tells the story. And if you break them apart and you stimulate the brain that activates a response, whether that's like standing up or picking up a cup or something, um, when that happens, when you, they stimulate the brain, like they'll say, they'll just say, okay, they'll tell you to do something, but the left side that tells the story didn't get the information until mm. later when they go, well, why'd you get up? And then the left side totally makes up a story mm. of what just happened, even though it was, it's like you would just, the real answer would just be because you told me to get up or whatever, it, it, but right. The left side makes up a story that matches what happened. I mean, right. and it's really interesting if you think, and so they're like, oh, so that actually just does sort of justify, like essentially we exist as the stories we tell ourselves, mm -hmm. that our brain tells ourselves based on our sensing, which is somewhat limited and compromised <laughs> and increasingly yeah. maybe subject to manipulation because of all the crap, the particles and frequencies and waves. So like when we have these strange things happen to people, like when either to uh, like that, that we do strange things or people do strange things to us. Like, and, and again, my dad, you know, he suffered from Alzheimer's at the end and they would often like, there would be elaborate stories of something, right? Like elaborate stories that had no bound bounding in like what the people around saw, but they were, they were very real to my dad, you know? And so the brain is just very active in telling, you know, telling you. So, yeah, but we were there together, so we both saw, experienced <laughs> the same two stories. As far as I know, we weren't both hypnotized. So, um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, so even exploring all this stuff with you, it's it's like, okay, this I feel pretty confident that this that this is a thing. You know, like I'm I'm working, doing video at a, a lot of these Ethereum events and and whatnot. So I'm like, okay, that's that's that's. I'm pretty confident that thing's going on there. Um, but then in terms of like, what's behind it? What's it for? What are the, like the deeper realities behind, behind, behind? They pull out the Anakian chessboard <laughs> to that, let me know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, it's, it, it's definitely interesting to explore, you know, you know, some potentialities. <laughs> exactly. So that's what we were doing in, in, in an environment. And again, that's going back to Leo's work of like man and the environment, right? Man embedded in the environment, the whole UNESCO and international geophysical year, like we're in a context and we're interacting with it. And then often Stefford has shared a paper with me the other day, or maybe it was this morning. I don't know. It all runs together, but it was about like these artifacts in the way, I think it was Karl Popper or something, but the way we, mm. we put our mind, our mental function into the environment and we use, we extend our consciousness through artifacts. And I'm assuming some of those could be books. Some of those could be my maps. Some of those would be plays or things that are exterior to our body that we outsource like memory storage or information in other forms. And then we interact with those artifacts. And so if you think about us as, sort of these complex socio-technical systems with stigmergy and pheromones and digital pheromones and tokens and all of that stuff, like that's kind of interesting too. 
So um, I feel like just with that context of synchronicities, environments, artifacts, um, and then sort of like in creative interpretation of some of the stuff as applied to broad themes of our life. And, and I, you know, the thing I've been thinking about, cause like ever really since the lockdowns, my life is just different. It's probably that one for a lot of people, right? Like the, you know, I was a, a mom who worked half time at a botanical garden and we would go on a once a year family vacation. And but like, there were certain things that were typical of how I do things. And then starting in the summer of 2020, that just totally collapsed, like for me in every way. And it hasn't, it's, it looks like it's just gonna stay collapsed. It will have to get rebuilt as something else, but won't be what it was. And so being able to have the time and space to look at themes, right? Like thematic structure, like when in my life, nor like do normal people who have, or who are working like their nine to five situation, busy with family obligations, busy with all these things, sit like contemplate morph morphic morphogenetic fields and how it relates. I thought everybody did that. I like, I mean, I'm weird. I, I don't, I'm, and I'm not saying because I'm better. I'm just like, I, this weird circumstance of the, how the world fell apart both destroyed a lot of things, but also held space for me to actually think about things in a systematic way. And I, I know you, you've thought about things in sort of a systematic way for a long time and, and with the frame you've had. But um, I think that, again, helps you figure out the symbolism because you actually can see things and apply them to themes that you're exploring intellectually that in a normal life, you just wouldn't be doing most, I wouldn't have been doing that. Yeah. Yeah, to totally. Um, yeah, I was already kind of ex trying to explore this, this space, but more from geopolitical and, and an econ economic framing. And then you like, kind of took it to the you next level. You know it's an inter interdimensional biofilm, <laughs> Jason. <laughs> yeah. Still not sure about the interdimensional biofilm, but I'm exploring. I, I'm, I'm, I'm stretching like my mind. To, I'm it's stretching like my placeholder. mind to try to, to try to. When the adoptions take over, we can, when the like <laughs> microalgae are like, great, we've won. We're going on an adventure. Then I'll be like, okay. Yeah. I don't know for sure it's that either, but it's a funny placeholder for the time. It's an it's, it's definitely an interesting placeholder for sure. And 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 the one thing I am you know, I, I think I talked about this before, but like kind of it's like the more you learn, the less you know or less the less you realize you know. <laughs> yeah. And so like even though I know a vastly I mean, I know so much more now than I did when I was in high school, but I'm I'm far less confident. <laughs> about what it is. <laughs> yeah. So well, it's... And I think some of it too is assigning motivation, right? So like a lot of my time, like, you know, until relatively recently was like, okay, so the good, bad, who's doing it? Are they controlled? Are they not? Are they on our side or the other side? Or the da, 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 da. like, there's a lot of time spent on that. And that's really like, ultimately, you will never know because the story in your head about people or things around you is not the same as the next person's story or what, who the person you're thinking about story about themselves. Like, they're all different stories. So there's not one thing that you can hone in on. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I find really interesting about this, like, the, the idea of, like, quantum superposition or, like, potentiality in the field, which today I just realized is, like, this quintessence from alchemy. Like they were dealing with this stuff back in the day, you know, Plato and then the Paracelsus, but this, this idea of emergent potential, like the void, which is also in, in maniac, this idea of a void from which things emerge. And, um, so anyway, I, I, I feel like, like a, a lot of these things, like if you don't have to assign it on a scale of the, like the motivation of it, you can just say it's coming. Like good or bad, this is a thing that's here. Yeah, yeah. And then you can start to see the pattern, but it's harder to see the pattern with the other energetics involved. At least I'm practicing that. Right. So, but the wave that the idea of an emergent field to me feels important. And that was one of the things to talk about, about the. Yeah, I agree. I'll say one more thing too. Like, even though, uh, like I'm less confident about what it is, I'm more confident about what it's not. And in and, and terms of some of the stories that, that I've had and I see other people having around me, 
as as seeing holes it's you know it's a lot easier to uh debunk or d disprove something than it is to to prove something so like in exploring all of this stuff you know if, if we could walk away from some of the stories that we're that we're we're carrying that are inaccurate it might open up space to explore some of these other possibilities so but like people are you know Although they don't... sometimes it's hard to judge because like i feel like a lot of it is motivation so like if people would look at my maps and they like say they're skeptical or they're you know maybe they're affiliated with people who are dots on the maps right and so they come in with a defensive position even though the dots are just showing relationships and money and connections and various things um like like there may be parts of some of the things that actually are useful. I guess that's what I'm trying to sort of play around with this idea like, oh, maybe it's not exactly that frame, but there's parts of the architecture of that frame that do feel consistent with what I'm exploring. And so with rather than like a hard stop that's totally wrong, like, I don't know, it just feels like, cause like I could see someone coming in and go, you're totally wrong, that person did not, um, even though they're connected to that thing, they're, they're not a bad person and they're not whatever. Like, I mean, you can show a connection, but it'll be a motivation. And I'm like, I'm not saying a motivation, but th there's an inherent sense of that. Like, and then that's the thing that will be debunked. It's like, oh, you know, I'm Bobby Kennedy, but I didn't adopt Bitcoin because I was building a super organism. I'm here to, you know, save the country and heal the, you know, drug addicted teens. You know, and that's a motivation story, right? As opposed to a structural story. So anyway, I just, I, I guess I'm a, I'm a little leery of the debunking because like I can feel like someone jumping in and being like, well, I'm going to debunk all of this. And at this point I'm saying, this isn't a hard truth, like particularly this, because this is our story, right? But that these are narratives that help us make sense out of the information that's coming through. And for some people it will resonate and for some people it won't. And I don't think we're ever going to get a story that's resonating, like an umbrella that's holding everybody, unless mm -hmm. it's the guy of fascia and we're all lobotomized, <laughs> like with frequency waves or something like that. So like, ultimately, everybody's going to be in their own story. And, you know, and it's hard because, you know, sometimes that means that we, we are, end up losing connection with people that we care about because we've ended up in different stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I, as far as the debunking thing, I was really, maybe that wasn't really even the best word, but just, I, I was thinking in terms of like the political stories and the economic oh. stories that, that we, oh, all, well. yeah, that's where that's where my mind was with oh, that, okay. because I know that that's the space where everybody operates. They're like, you know, they're so engaged in this political process or they're, they're, they're looking at the world through the lens of um, economics. And, and I just realized how false like so much of that is like it's not it's not an accurate story about how the world's actually operating um you know it's but it it's, is for the people who believe it is i mean i guess that's yeah. what's really weird it's like they're making their own reality in their head because yeah. that's the story they live inside but i guess that would be like if you go to a movie and you think the movie's real <laughs> I know. you could actually in your own head you're like actually there like you know and i think people do have that where they they can experience a movie they really get into it you know it's when now yeah. we have larping and you know a role-playing game so you can really get into it but at the same time uh, you know, you're still uh, sitting in your pajamas and, and watching a movie, you know? <laughs> uh, well, okay. I mean, and there's the bigger question about the whole Maya stuff, right? Like, oh, are we, you know, and I know we- And I'm working exactly on- I'm, on to that, yeah. but I'm like, how many nested layers of games are there? Like, is this a game? <laughs> like, yeah. Sometimes I realize, in fact, you know, like in making this map of Maniac, um, you know, because I know that they have these like puzzle quests, right? like these complex puzzle quests. And I was like telling Steffers as we're unfolding this whole thing, which again, this, the series has gotten a lot of coverage online, but at a certain level, right? But not mostly the stuff we're looking at. And I'm like, is this a puzzle? You know, is this, um, are we in it? Are we doing it? Is this computation? Like, are we making, you know, like, like, it's like, you know, this is essentially this maniac schizophrenia crystallography map and I'm not done. Like, and yeah, all those I, yellow I, dots are like screenshots from the maniac TV show. Right. And it, yeah. and it goes literally from like North myth, Norse mythology and 
uh, Wilhelm Reich, you know, Oregon Energy over to Yates. I mean, yeah, I haven't really you know, even explored. You, I mean, personal story, you know, yeah. of of like literally where my husband and I met in Venice in a study abroad program, and the house that we lived in that was owned by the university was named after a lipid biochemist. And then whoop, the door opened on lipid biochemistry and schizophrenia, and I was off to the races, you know? So I'm like, is this a game? Like sometimes I ask myself, hmm. but I yeah, don't I know. I haven't had a chance to really explore this map, but yeah, this is your maniac map. It's a maniac map, yeah. She's a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the thing is, it's the Stan Ulam computer. Uh, well, not Stan, I guess Nick Metropolis, but Los Alamos. Stan Ulam wrote the um, chess game for... Uh, maniac it followed up from ENIAC, which was made at pen hmm. so. all right so yeah uh yeah so synchronicity plays uh, a significant role in our arkansas trip <laughs> yeah and the crystal stuff just going back to the weird like i just want to pointing out like crystals were a big thing in arkansas and so the the curies and the society for psychical research and they're in, like the, the Curie brothers developing piezoelectricity with quartz and then the, all of their interests in the Society for Psychical Research. I mean, to end radium, right? So to me, those were all really important things to consider as we're thinking about sort of LARPy, Jungian, crystallography, gaming, radiation, radiated gaming <laughs> scenarios. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, well, so um, let's... Uh, Let's explore more about our trip okay. here. Uh, so just, you know, can you resituate people like where, yeah. so we started in Denver and yeah. then we. Well, I'll just say, so, I mean, how this trip actually came about was you were, you had said to me that you were, you know, kind of exploring places to live that would be inexpensive and that you actually were looking at Arkansas. And I have some good friends that live in uh, Rogers, Arkansas, that I was actually planning on visiting. I've been planning on visiting for a month, you know, and I wanted to go sometime in like October, November. And so I said, you know, I'm going to be heading down that way. Uh, you know, if you want, we can explore, we can do some camping and you could kind of explore the area a little bit. And so, and then, and, and I was initially thinking you would just like meet me in Tulsa or meet me somewhere down there, but then you're like, well, why don't I just fly into Denver? And I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, well, if we're going, we're, if you're coming into Denver, we should stop at Colorado Springs. Cause there's a lot of crazy stuff in Colorado Springs. And then, um, and I wanted and, to go to Mount Evans and that was like the time dilation and radio right. astronomy stuff. Which is now Mount Blue Sky because they changed the name because we've moved on from that, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I said, you know what, we need to visit a couple places, which is uh, the Sand Creek uh, Massacre site, uh, which Robert, or not Robert Evans, uh, <laughs> um, Evans, John. What's this? John Evans, thank you. Uh, he was our the, the governor of the territory of Colorado at the time. And, uh, and then the other place was the Amache Japanese internment camp. So I was like, well, we should, we should definitely take these two stops along the way. And so, yeah, so that's where we're at. We, we, you know, we, so we've already done in one of our previous talks, I can't remember which one, one of our previous Arkansas talks, we talked about going to Cheyenne mountain and, and our visits, the U S air force Academy and, uh, whatnot in, uh, Colorado Springs. So so again, this so is we like went across the plains. And, yeah, um, this is the, right literally the second. Springs, like in the, there's an army base there too, like Fort it, Carson. It was one of, Fort Carson. So it's like I had no idea, but it's one of the largest like infantry training grounds in the country, like hundreds of thousands of acres, I guess, of just plains in eastern Colorado. I had no idea, so mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. Right opposite the the Cheyenne Mountain. Yeah, exactly. And so we're driving through the through the prairie. Yeah. So this is like, so here we are, this is our second, I, I really our second day we, we got into the Sand Creek massacre site. Um, and so, so yeah, I guess we'll, we'll just go through here. Um, uh, so this is just talking about, uh, how the, the mountain, which is now blue sky. Um, uh, but the background is, it was, it was called Mount Evans at the time. And um, it's it's tied to the 1864 massacre, and so for those of and you, Evans uh, essentially he authorized the killings, 
Like he was the territorial governor at the time. Correct. Yeah, they say kind of unofficially, but you know, like I think it was a it's wink like, and a nod. Yeah, yeah. I'm on my yeah. way to DC. I'm out of town. You guys, yeah. keep an eye on things. For he, me. he laid you know? he laid the groundwork for all of this to happen. Like he basically, you know, gave the green light to to kill any of the uh, indigenous people outside of you know that that are off their reservation. And so, um, do you, uh, so do do we want to? So I want to say a couple of things about um, Evans because yeah, I think actually uh, Sean alerted me to that because he's been really interested in the whole like insane asylum uh, milieu, and I know that's a whole other thing, and I kind of think it kind of overlaps with some of those mud flood Tartaria people, but like these these large institutional buildings, right? If often from the nineteenth century. Um, and there's postcards and things. Some of them are still standing. And it's like, how are there that many insane people, <laughs> right? Like trying to figure out like what was going on with how, and we had, and a lot of them are based on this Kirkbride model, which is, uh, they, the, I don't know if you can look up Kirkbride model, maybe on one of the tabs. He was Quaker, I believe. So like one of the earliest Kirkbride is actually in, here in Philadelphia, like in Northeast Philly. Um, so a lot of these big, mental institutions were Kirkbide related. And um, so uh, John Evans, he was born in Ohio and he was a Quaker. And um, and then he they moved to Indiana. Yeah, the Kirkbride plan. Um, Thomas Story Kirkbride, 1809 to 1883. And these Kirkbride design asylums were enormous. Like maybe you can click on that, that Traverse City state hot, like just the picture there. I think it might open up bigger. Like they're very large. And you're like, how many crazy people were there, <laughs> right? Like what yeah. what was actually going on? Which I don't, I, I have to say, like I'm a little, like my reservation is on the Tartaria mud flood stuff. Like I'm not so sure about that. But on the other hand, these buildings clearly exist and that would be a lot of insane people. So why, what categorized as insane and what were they all doing in there um, percent population wise for these small towns? Well, I used to, you know, I like a lot of the, you know, I'm a big movie guy and a lot of the movies that came out in the forties were about like, they were comedies, but they were like, the story would be like, this person gets committed to a mental hospital sort of thing <laughs> against their own thing. And one of my favorite movies of, uh, with, of Jimmy Stewart is called Harvey. Have you ever see Harvey? Oh yeah. I, I, the it's rabbit? A, yeah. It's a great movie. He has an imaginary, but he's like a dan they call it a dandy, you know, but he's just like a really friendly guy that goes around. He hangs out drinking at the bar, but he has, and everybody loves him. He's not caught, but he, but like his, he's, his, uh, I don't know if it's his sisters. I think it's his sisters that feel uncomfortable because they're trying to be like, like socialites or whatever. Uh -huh. And so, but he has an imaginary, you know, rabbit friend. He's like, oh, this is my, this is my friend Harvey, you know, and he, he goes out and, and he goes drinking with Harvey. Um, totally harmless, whatever. But like, then they, they, com they get him committed to the hospital. But I remember like, they could just commit people like against their will. Like, but they, you'll see this theme in a lot of like the movies from like the thirties and forties, uh, where people are getting committed, but they're usually kind of like lighthearted or whatever. But it, yeah. I got, it got me thinking about like, yeah, like, well, I mean, obviously some guys walking around with a, with imaginary rabbit. Okay. This guy's crazy or whatever. Well, is the harmful, you know, who, who cares? Yeah. But, but like the idea of like what constitutes uh, whether or not someone's mentally ill, uh, you know, because I know that I'm sure this was used. There were it was probably used for political, you know, to mm -hmm. put your political opponents, your economic, you know, you want someone's land. There's probably a lot of a lot of reasons why you could classify somebody. I mean, think about the Salem witch trials. We know now that yeah. a lot of that was around land. Uh, a, it was actually a land grab. Uh, but you have some but way that you can classify to, someone to like as think about the Quakers too mm -hmm. because again they were children of the light and <clears throat> so this is what i'm trying to play with a little bit lately today in this maniac area that it's sort of overlapping with like like um anaki and magic and tokens and the soulbound tokens and lubin and consensus and this idea of a consensus in the quaker church which is interesting because it's silence right it's silent like and then people like take turns in speaking and they have a whole consensus process around decision making and how their consensus, which is SUS, may overlap with Joseph Lubin's consensus, which is SYS consensus and SUS consensus. And um, 
to me, and, and, and again, like I don't have this all dialed in yet, but the idea of using tokens and consensus and signaling, because the Quakers were also helped develop something, this sociocracy, this, this guy, I think his name is Engelberg or something, Endelberg. Um, if you look up sociocracy and try to put like Endelberg or something on there, um, it's close. It's he's Dutch. He was like a Dutch electrical engineer working for Philips and the oil companies. And he went to Quaker boarding school run by the Cadburys in the Netherlands. And he came up with this idea of sociocracy, which is like a consensus based decision making system, but I think sort of with tokens. And so I think that this is going, it came out of Auguste Comte. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, Dutch educator, uh, Kiesbach and the Cadburys, the chocolate, again, we've got like chocolate and the candy and possibly the sugar people and sugar programming. Hmm. And um, they developed this idea of this sort of token consensus. And so I'm thinking you've got the Quakers, you've got consensus, you've got tokens. Oh, here we go. And then at the same time that a lot of this stuff was going on, yeah, that's this guy. Um, he, Ger Gerhard Endenberg, yeah. So he's Dutch. This is expanding. The first big sociocracy project, Shocker, is a children's congress of girls in India. Or maybe it's not girls. Maybe it's just children in India, right? So if you're going to go after, like, again, people with a certain, like, grounded aspect, you go after the kids and you go after India. Um, and you put tokens in their hands. And so what I'm thinking, and this is something that just literally came up right before we recorded, someone shared like a link to a blog post, something about Joseph Mercola, that he's ill, supposedly, which I'm, I'm very bad, I, you know, I feel badly. I don't, um, you know, I don't wish anyone to be in bad health circumstances, but evidently fairly recently, there was some news that broke and like, correct me, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected if I'm wrong, because I only read this one article and I didn't have time to source all the other stuff, but um, that he was changing his business plan and that he had been channeling like an interdimensional entity and that he was going to write a whole book series about it. <laughs> now, um, and so I think this is really interesting. So if Mercola is doing like essentially stepping into the interdimensional channeling center and he's Mr. Supplements and White Hat Crypto, like what does that all mean for like the potential overlap of crypto with sociocracy, with token signals and interdimensional communication and like Quaker and photonics. Like to me, it's almost sounding like, again, and they're very close with RFK Jr. and the whole, you know, the Bitcoin and these supplements programs, this idea of having institutions with people who have been put there because they are either have addiction issues or mental health issues. And then you've, you've got these systems because again, um, Quantum Heart Cafe has done all that early work on token economies in pre-K jails and mental institutions. You you already have the token economy in the mental I'm, I'm just kind of coming together for me. So mm. like what if, and again, this is my map dealing with schizophrenia, there are people who's sensing, like their biological sensing is attuned to access the field in ways that quote unquote, like right performing people cannot, but you could put them into an institution with a system that would enable them to potentially source information from the field for some purpose in the present reality. I don't know. Like it's, it's just interesting. You see what I'm going with it? Like you've got, yeah. you've got like large numbers of people institutionalized, which again, if RFK Jr. like gets on his program with setting up rural addiction centers everywhere with the Scientologists, like, you know, and I'm not saying for sure, but like, he definitely is allied with the Scientologists. So like whether the Scientologists are gonna have a role in those rehab centers or not, like that's a big concern of mine. But so you've got these rural rehab centers and then that seems to be the newest version, but maybe like the pop-up of these giant other institutions. And then what if there is something in the biochemistry of those people who can, who are a technology? I mean, I, I don't mean it in a grotesque way, but almost like a tech, but they need an alphabet or an infrastructure or something to source the stuff, which would be these tokens. I've been talking about the tokens as a, like a language of manifestation or intercommunication. And, and then some of the map I was just working on today literally goes into like Anakian magic, 
which is like very popularized now in the chaos magic. And, and it does tend to overlap in some ways with some of these token spaces. Like, you know, th there's overlaps with at least from a brand standpoint with sort of more um, occulted esoteric ideas anyway, platonic, you know, neoplatonism, different aspects of that. So yeah, it makes me really think a little bit differently about mental institutions. And again, very interesting that Evans was um, a Quaker and setting up one of these Kirkbride programs. I was looking at this thing too. Do you know much about holacracy? I mean, we've talked about Hollands and I've just never heard the term holacracy. Holacracy, that's a... Yeah, well, and then you've got Agile, which is its <clears throat> own whole computing system, right? Mm -hmm. Agile and Lean, which is this sort of, again, in, in my mind, that's like a resilient tensegrity kind of thing. Like remaking society as, as the organism. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know these last two people, like Bernhard Buckelbrink. You should look that up. Yeah, those but, are, and James Priest. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, I want to, like, acknowledge Sean, because he was the one who I think originally put me on to Evans, and then I didn't realize that he was the one literally connected to Sand Creek, because remember that w for people who were listening to, like, the very early episodes where we were on Mount Evans, it's high above the tree line and it's uh, early radio astronomy and they were doing very important research into um like time dilation and muons there <laughs> during mm. the 30s and 40s and so you kind of already have sort of a weird wormhole time thing going on already on that mountain which is strange so and there's yeah. like glacial lakes this like series of glacial lakes up there so anyway so he was the territory like so he 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 was in Indi in ohio set up the mental hospital in Indiana, which I think in Indianapolis, which I will say about 40 minutes outside of Indianapolis, maybe you can Google this, like spiritualism in Indiana. Um, one of the main spiritualist centers that John Fetzer often frequented was about 40 minutes like Northeast of Indianapolis. And so, um, and in Indianapolis, it's also home to the Lumina Foundation. So again, we're thinking optics and photonics and um, lumen, illumination, light, you know, again, the, the Quaker light, and they're doing all of the um, financing, like student loan financing for this like work college career ready continuum, which is the cybernetic program. And, um, and then also Eli Lilly is in Indianapolis and Eli Lilly is the big pharmaceutical company, but I believe that they're also, I'm trying to think, the Lilly Foundation, I think it funded, funds free market stuff and Christian stuff. Um, and I don't know that it has a spiritualist aspect, but I think it definitely would overlap with the super organism in terms of free market choice. Because I think that Friedman had something in Indianapolis early on too. Hmm. Like the Milton Friedman Foundation was in Indianapolis. So you've got this agents and spiritualism and... The main thing that comes stuff. up when I do spiritualism in Indiana is this Camp Chesterfield. Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. Is that is that what you're? That's it. Yeah, that's where John Fetzer spent did a lot of the channeling. Yeah, the Spiritual Center in Camp Chesterfield, Indiana Association of Spirit, 1886, 1886? Is that what it says? Eighteen was uh da, 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 1840s. Oh, uh, okay. Community, community guys have seen it. Spirits of the Dead in 1840s. No, wait, that's it. Just says 1800s here, but yeah, mid eight. So. Yeah, this, yeah, so this spiritualism is, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me because again, I'm not so much on the esoteric side, but clearly a lot of money is being put into, it was important, significant in the day. The Fetzer Foundation is very strategic in its giving. It often partners with um, the Templeton Foundation. And again, John Fetzer, his background was in radios. He was Seventh-day Adventist and early radio frequency. So we're back to crystals and crystal radio and broadcasting. And so, um, yeah, like, is it quantum physics or is it spiritualism or is it some of both or, you know, what's going on here? But this, this Evans, like, it's almost, he's one of those people that you, when you look at his bio, like, could one guy have done all these things, right? Like you, you, you create a mental mm -hmm. hospital, then you move to Chicago and you, you, you help build the first hospital in Chicago, and then you start building rail, railroads and the real estate, and then you're the governor of Colorado. I and mean, that's just a lot of stuff to be done by like one guy. Um, 
And yeah, and so then like at, during this thing, can, can you maybe give a little bit of the setup to like what was going on in Colorado at the time? Like, cause I mean, he was with, in railroads, right? Real estate and railroads. Those people are not interested in having in people with an indigenous way of being on the land anywhere near their land development projects. Like that was in incompatible to capitalism. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know exactly. I mean, I know at the time, it, uh, most of the stuff I know about has to do with like gold rush and like all, you know, the, the mining, all the mining that yeah. was going on. I haven't delved too deeply into the, you know, like what was going on with real estate at the time, actually. That would be interesting to explore. Um, well, most of the railroads were put in through ways and then they had land mm -hmm. to develop on either side. Right, exactly. And then once the land was developed, you create a town. And so that was like the money was in the real, like paired real estate with the railroads. Exactly. And so having, you know, people who had, you know, a seasonal mobile lifestyle that wasn't based in property rights, right? Like they didn't own, you know, you, that they were, that was an impediment to manifest destiny, right? I mean, and we, we talked about a lot of that in the beginning of our work and, and it's still very relevant. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, the, the backside is the trauma that was enacted on indigenous communities is now being in some ways used, it's, it's being, used to like justify these, it's being turned into capital <laughs> commons, you know? Yeah. But a new kind, like the, the creative commons or the kind commons or the whatever, like we're going to go back to animist only it's going to be with tokens and we're going to create a hive mind, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll will wash it with a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion to make it seem okay. And, and again, I don't speak for indigenous people, but I think if people actually knew the, the broader plans about these tokens that they, and some of the technologies that the push for like indigenous futurism and Afrofuturism and all of that, like it wouldn't fly the way it is, but I don't think people have this background. Right. So what was interesting about Evans is was he was actually forced to resign due to his part, even though he, you know, he claimed to have, like, I didn't have any, I was out of town and it wasn't me sort of thing. There, there was enough public pressure, I, I guess, at the time to get him. Well, to and resign. can we say like what the massacre was though? Yeah. Like, so, I mean, broadly speaking, I mean, there were altercations, right? There were ongoing clashes and then they would make treaties and arrangements and then those would be broken. And then ultimately this group it was sort of like, if you don't all go to the forts, we'll assume anyone who isn't at the fort is a hostile and then we can kill you, right? So there wasn't much of a choice of, of people. And this particular group was trying to get situated and they told them where to be. They're like, go down to the creek and you know, this is the military and put up your tents and put up a white flag. And this again, mostly older people and women and children and you know, just follow the rules and this will be okay, you know? And then, Ultimately, the, the, the person who was manning the fort nearby had his own derangement kind of syndrome and essentially s snuck up on th this encampment, this peaceful encampment in the middle of the night and massacred everyone, like hundreds, hundreds of people in the night. Like it was, there was no, I mean, you know, even with wounded knee and that wasn't legitimate, but they made up a story about like, oh, the people, you know, somebody dropped a gun and then this happened. But these people were asleep, you know, like it, it, it was in the middle of the night. This, it was premeditated and, mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was really a horrific, horrific uh, situation. Um, some of these, uh, these are, yeah. So Silas Soul, is that his name? Soul Soleil? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure how to pronounce Silas, it. Silas S-O-U-L-E. So, um, and he was, uh at Sand Creek. And so not all of the people who were present for the massacre participated. Like a lot of them, like a number of them saw that it was a massacre and were trying to stop them. And so I'll just read, this is a, a signboard from the History Museum in Denver that's about the Sand Creek massacre. Um, uh, Silas Stillman Soul saved many lives at Sand Creek when he ordered his men not to fire on the Cheyenne and Arapaho people camped there. Though Soleil was a loyal soldier, he clearly saw the massacre for what it was, the wholesale slaughter of mostly defenseless old men, women, and children. Many Cheyenne and Arapaho people feel a deep sense of gratitude for Soul's bravery. Without his willingness to disobey evil orders, many of us surely wouldn't be alive today. A month after the massacre, Silas wrote a series of heart-wrenching letters to one of his commanding officers, 
detailing the barbaric acts of acts other U.S. troops had carried out at the Big Sandy Creek. Soul's letter and later testimony at the government inquiries into the massacre helped draw attention to the horrific atrocities of the massacre. But less than a year later, the men who wanted to cover up the atrocities of Sand Creek Massacre murdered Soul on the streets of Denver. He is buried in Riverside Cemetery in North Denver and a plaque commemorating his bravery is at the corner of 15th and Arapaho. Yeah. So he would have gotten away with it if this guy hadn't like said something, right? I mean, it, right. it was meant to be gotten away with. And ultimately somebody took a moral stand at the time with, with, with pretty dire, ultimately dire consequences for himself, but to, to, to oppose, to, to stand down his people while this was happening. And, um, and it wasn't, I mean, I mean, my understanding, like the nature of the weapons used was that there were, um, it was really grotesque. I mean, it was, it was, it was grotesque carnage that was carried out uh, again against defenseless people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we're trying to sort of navigate again, you know, I'm just, people have heard me say this before, but you know, this is why I just can't get down with the whole God bless America, red, white, and blue Patriot, save the country nationalist framing. I've never, because like essentially in yeah. my, to my way of thinking, part of the reason that we're here in this situation is that this country has a lot of trauma and a lot of bad, dark energy of things that haven't been properly addressed. And I don't mean in terms of tearing down a statue or yeah, something yeah, yeah, super, totally. some superficial thing or like, here, well, let that's me give the you challenge is, Yeah. A lot of this, a lot like, of the, what does this look like? a lot of the addressing of this right now is being cultivated and, and steered uh, that that's not actually dealing with the underlying problem. It's actually being being used for other things that are to come. Um, and that's the problem. But, but, but that, that doesn't mean that they, they shouldn't be addressed. It just means that we should be critical of how they're being addressed as well as being insistent that they do be, be addressed. And so it's right. a weird place. Cause it's, a, it's, again, it's one of those Hegelians, you know, well, which side do you want? It's like, well, no, actually there's, I, I see this and I see this as well. <laughs> right. We need to incorporate all of that into our, in our, into our discussion. We bring up here, like the Lincoln peace medal and, and the, you know, the treaties and all these other things, when we think about contracts, and I think we talk wow. about co contracts here a little bit here with related to marriage contracts and the pomegranate, but um but yeah the idea the ideas of like the, the legitimacy yeah. the legi yeah, well, legitimacy just, we, you, you, go ahead right well so just along the lines of the peace medals because that's another thing that sean has been looking at because it's interesting he actually has connections to philadelphia and the the mint like the the people that that, that would mint coins but also these peace medals so that's an interest of his and um, so when we were in the Denver History Museum in the, in the exhibit about um, the massacre, they had an exhibit of showing one of these peace medals minted in Philadelphia in 1862. And it said that uh, Cheyenne Chief Lean Bear died wearing a peace medal like this one. And he was among a delegation who visited the White House to establish peaceful relationships with the government in 1863, right? And so, I mean, I think when you're you're talking about agreements, yeah, these medals, accepting peace medals is sort of like taking an oath or entering into an agreement in a symbolic, that's an artifact. So when, when we're talking about like using- it's kind of a token, medals, really. <laughs> it is, it is a token. Like, yeah. I think it's actually a really important idea of this, uh, a symbolic token bestowance. And yet uh, in legitimacy, like, it's interesting to think about because it's what is it? What kind of metal? It's a peace metal. Well, what have I been saying for a long time about what peace actually is? Peace is about like metabolic homeostasis in a superorganism, right? The superorganism that was coming was manifest destiny, right? It was a new superorganism. The homeostasis of the new superorganism in the fitness landscape of the new superorganism meant attempted erasure of the original people of that land because the new superorganism, it would be a cancer, right? 
I mean, and I'm not saying that because I believe it's a cancer, but in this specific idea of you're a cell or you're an agent under the dome, as Stephen talks about, right? Following the, the understood rules of society and civilization, or you're outside and you're a cancer cell and we will inflict the power of the gut, even if that means you're elderly and women and children and defenseless. Like, and, and so that's the thing I wanna sort of make clear as far as what's evolving with the web three tokenization, it is going to connect to the morph morphogenetic fields. And it is about installing a new super organism that looks like some sort of interconnected global consciousness, global intelligence based in um, a consciousness mind and a fascia body. And so where do those of us fit in who don't want to play the peace metal game? Like that we don't end up you know, that, that we acknowledge the sacrifices of Cheyenne Chief Lean Bear holding his peace medal, like not realizing, oh, the peace is like I signed on for was this organism that literally needs to eject my, like my culture to enable it to proceed. And so I, I, that's, I think that's a really important lesson that we need to understand. And like, what is this new super organism? Have we agreed to to accept these tokens? Like maybe we should not be at the peace table at all. <laughs> like maybe we shouldn't. Like maybe don't go to the White House. I mean, you're 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 the one who was previously talking about the the story of politics, and they keep people busy in the story of politics, but that's not what it really is. It's there's some other energetic happening. Right. When it's also challenging too, because like where do someone I was talking to someone the other day about like where do you go? They always say like, well, if you don't like this country, you know, like leave and i'm like great where where can i go how, how where can i go to leave you know to get outside the dome you know maybe there's yeah. someone someone some other dome over here that i can go in and i don't agree with that one either but like think about the the people of this um th that were living on this land you know what what were their choices like they tried to play ball they says you know we tried to make peace again they tried to you know they, they did everything from fight back to capitulate and, and they were still, um, you know, largely like murdered, but then also assimilated and, and, and conquered. And so, yeah, I mean, what, what are well, the- Well, and it's interesting. One of the things I want to talk about, like mention in light of the conversation we had last time about uh, like the child, children being used for channels and the ed tech, right? Is like when you- think about the boarding schools. So we just were talking about the psychiatric institutions, right? And what that might, like what, I'm not saying that they were doing interdimensional token exchanges back then, but like, I don't know what it might've looked like, but it seems like there might be the capacity of doing it like coming up, right? And and you think about the the residential schools that for like, for many were death camps really, um, work camps and death camps, um, you know, assimilation camps that, those were children who were raised in a culture that was literally embedded in on the land and saw was interacting with the cosmos as a spiritual field of relatives right and and that was something that was very new to me when i first started because again unless somebody introduces you to this idea you have no idea i was like looking at standing rock and they were talking about like the buffalo was a relative and it, it felt so foreign to me the first couple times I heard it. I was like, it just shows how far off we are, right? Like we don't think of the world as relatives, as interconnected. Now, now it's going to come back to the fore, right? Because now it's like the Hopi prophecy and all the indigenous people at the UN and everything, because now what they actually want is the interdimensional access, right? Now the, the cultural grounding spiritual grounding of indigenous people on land is the next thing that is the next technology that's the next spiritual technology but it has to be wedded into this web 3 nanoparticle energetic field system like militarized system and it's a military mind control system so anyway i just i stopped to think about like what the flip side of res residential schools is going to look like now like and is it going to look like oh we're going to offer you know culturally responsive charter schools with LARPy forest school and put the in, indigenous kids in smart, you know, and send them to go to like, you know, out in the bush, you know, and, and to practice their religion, but like in, within this panopticon 
So because, because we're going to use like the mirror data fields to, to manifest something off of that. Like that's sort of what it's trying to feel like me. And then to frame it as, you know, uplifting indigenous culture, right? Acknowledging it, making amends when I don't think that that's what it is. I think it's just another iteration of, oh, go camp by the creek. You'll be fine. We mm -hmm. promise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So yeah, this placard, this is from the Colorado History Museum. And um, yeah, basically it was just saying that they were, they, they had attempted, the Cheyenne Arapaho chiefs <clears throat> had made every effort to create peace. Um, and it said that they had, uh, they had met uh, Black Kettle, sent a letter to Colorado's territorial governor, John Evans, uh, how to achieve peace. The governor was reluctant to meet, but told Black Kettle to bring a peaceful delegation to Camp Weld, the military outpost in Denver. So Cheyenne and Arapaho leaders met with Governor Evans and Colonel uh, John Shivington, who is the one who led the charge. And there was a whole thing about the John Shivington because there was a statue. Uh, it wasn't John Shivington. It was like a Union soldier. But there was a bunch of controversy because I think there was a... There was a placard, I think, honoring John Shivington at the Capitol, and they, anyway, mm -hmm. they took the they took the thing <clears> down <throat> uh, at the at the at the Denver Capitol. Um, but uh, so, yeah, t more than two hundred thirty peaceful Cheyenne and Arapaho women, children, and elders were murdered at Sandy Creek, and they were again they were they were trying to they were trying to go play ball. <laughs> right. Like, you know? what do we need to do? Oh, okay. Go there. Okay. We go there and then they come in and get attacked. Yeah. So that's right. just, exactly. So that's just a timeline. Um, this, this, this goes into, uh, the prospectors looking to come to Denver. Um, and yeah, I hadn't really thought, you know, like the stories we always hear, uh, you know, is had, it has to do with prospecting and gold, but not even like thinking about the role, like like Montessori. That's actually a, a real estate. The, the real estate, all the real estate yeah. around around all of this, all of these other things. There's other things yeah. that are going on. The charter schools are the railroads of real estate today. <laughs> oh, by the way, real quick, let me show you something. Uh, this just came out today. It's you know the the NOAA, the Human Energy Noosphere N two oh, conference. Yeah. Okay. They've been releasing videos. So look at the title of this. Uh, Look at the title of this talk that just oh came out. Oh my goodness. So I uh, thought that title would get so your- We kind of, should read it for people listening. So, so it says, Shaping Noospheric Adults with Montessori Cosmic Education. And this is on the Human Energy YouTube channel. This actually, I haven't watched this yet. Does it, it just, come with like a pack of uh, <laughs> <laughs> mushrooms or something? Like, I, mean, like, I hope on. so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the headset. Here's your EEG monitor. Oh your my gosh. Snack. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that title. I'm like, oh, I gotta. I, gotta I should tell. watch that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't, I haven't watched you know, it, but yeah, they've been releasing. Their coach, you know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, anyways, we the Sand Creek, and this this actually we visited later on in Denver, the Colorado History Museum. But there was a there was a there was a whole floor basically dedicated to mostly this um yeah it says it can i just read what yeah that says? sure um, weapons of mass destruction uh u.s soldiers used rapid fire rifles swords bayonets pistols and devastating shrapnel shells from howitzer artillery cannons against our family members at sand creek they were the same weapons of mass destruction used during the most horrifying battles of the civil war but at sand creek these weapons tore apart peaceful women children and the elderly in the early 2000s, a team of Cheyenne and Arapaho elders, along with archaeologists and officials from the National Park Service, recovered bullets, shell casings, and other items from the massacre site. These finds helped convince Congress to create the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site in southeastern Colorado. And um, like they have, you know, several excavations of showing like all of the shrapnel and the size of the balls, these 12-pound cannons and stuff. It's really bad. Yes. And it's brutal, really. The whole thing is just brutal. So, oh, and this is this is Evans's. Uh, this is that hospital in in Indiana. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. When you look at and it's quite. I mean, it's actually a very pretty building. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know what it would be like to be insane there. I don't think it would probably still be very fun, even though the building was beautiful. But they're enormous. So you do it. You do wonder, like, 
what was yeah. really going on. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a very big building. Yeah, you. is this a human energy? Were they doing cosmic Montessori adult education <laughs> for people who are like non, non-traditional non learners or something in there? Like what was really going on? Exactly. So then you made, of course, you, you made one of your hearts yeah. out there. Well, do, do we want to say like when we pulled in just the setup for this? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So you Okay. Yeah, so like, yeah, like, we, oh, you should say that before. Like, yeah, put for the sure. little bag up. Show me the show the little bag the picture with the bag. <laughs> okay. Okay. So just as a reminder, like so before we left, um, I stayed with your aunt and she had a lovely garden and it was almost like we were in October, so it was about freezing. And so I was helping her clean up a little bit in the garden and she had these beautiful dahlias. And so I was like, Do you mind if I take a few? Because we make these hearts. So um, I had a lot of the holy basil, which like made us kind of sneeze our heads off and are the seed heads of the Hosey, holy basil. I left her the Hosey, holy basil and I took the seed heads. Yeah, but and it was a potent, the bag was very potent. It was very <laughs> the, potent, the, yeah. the ingredients of that bag were very potent. They were, they were, well, see, we needed strong medicine to address yeah. <laughs> some of these places that we had to go. Um, and so, yeah, so we pull up in the van and I think there's maybe one other car in the parking lot. Again, we're, there's, it's, this, is a, this is a distant, this is not heavily visited park service site, like in terms of just, you know, the content and also distance, you know, you have to really want to get there. Um, and so we get out of the car and I've got my bag. I don't think the dahlia is sticking out quite that much. And um, cause I'm going to make a heart and um, a park service ranger comes over and he greets us and he, there was like a talk in progress, but it was in a different part of the park over on a bluff. So he was kind of giving us orientation and telling us we could go to the talk over there. And he saw the bag and I think initially thought that it, it was a picnic lunch because <laughs> like who who does the stuff that we do, right? And so he's like, oh, well, if you want to have a picnic, like there's a picnic table right there or whatever. And so we got to talking a little bit. And... Um, I, I can't remember exactly how it came up, but we, it was maybe like, where, where was he before he had been at this particular site? Mm -hmm. Because we were explaining, you know, like why we were interested in being there broadly. And he had said he had been previously at, I don't know, if, right before, but um, Fort Union in New Mexico. And then he was originally from New Mexico and his, his family, like, I'm not sure if it was, um, like Latino, maybe mixed Latino indigenous, but like he was very clearly someone who was aligned with understanding like the intensity of this site and what it meant, right, for indigenous people. And um, he had started out his work in the park service at Fort Union, which is in um, north, near the um, Sangre de Cristo mountains in Northern New Mexico, like north of, there's a Las Vegas, New Mexico, which is I think north of Albuquerque. So, um, and, he, he said that and I was like, really? Because when I was in my graduate program at the University of Pennsylvania in historic preservation, they had a summer course and the summer course was like six weeks and three weeks was at Fort Union and three weeks was at Fort Davis in West Texas. And we were doing <clears throat> adobe conservation. And you, you can see from the pictures here, um, and again, I'm clueless. I'm in my mid twenties. I don't really know anything about the world. <clears throat> beyond what's been told to me, like I'm not at all, my view is very limited. So I didn't appreciate that it wasn't the greatest thing to be out conserving Adobe on a military fort in <laughs> New Mexico. <laughs> like that, that was a complicated and fraught history. I was just there to like reattach the plaster on these walls. And 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 it's, it's an interesting site because the, the fort itself, there's so little wood or timber in that part of New Mexico that um, once the fort was decommissioned, people came and took the timber and reused it. So essentially the fort itself is just these almost like monolithic adobe structures, but there's no roof. So the only way you can tell the inside from the outside is where the white plaster is. So anyway, that's what we were working on. And I was like, really, when were you there? And we were there at the same time in the mid 1990s, <laughs> like Frank Matero was the, the advisor at Penn. And so literally our path and this is again one of these distant like eight miles down a dirt road not a popular park service this is not yellowstone like this is not zion this is like a distant historic site and our paths like crossed there 30 years ago yeah so then Same the guy started talking and then he brings up that his brother is in ai 
Uh, yeah. Well, he's <laughs> clearly very aligned with the indigenous, like, right, right. sovereign, you know, rights. And, you know, and he's like, sort of like he's a little bit of an outlier and he has a brother who's highly involved in tech. And so later it turns out that the brother, like I, I looked up the name and he's in Hawaii, but his background is actually in human computer interaction, not just AI, but the human computer interaction around language learning, which is these large, you know, and, and I think some of the, the language learning stuff is going to be linked to literacy impact bonds ultimately. Like that's why they want to get social impact bonds for all the kids who are immigrants um, and mm -hmm. foreign language learners. Um, so this was just, and, and you know, of course, you know me, I'm, I'm always like 150%, right? And so I'm really trying to convince him of all of like the narratives and how they're gonna be spun and what to look out for and the role, because again, in indigenous communities, there's so much trauma. So you think about, again, epigenetics and again, and again, changes in diet that were imposed on people because they were removed from their land. And that had long-term health consequences, chronic illness consequences for the not getting proper nutrition. And then ultimately people often self-medicating with alcohol and other drugs. So like indigenous peoples, you know, and, and black and brown people, like, but they're kind of the core group of these social impact bonds. So the whole residential, and, and a lot of it's also tar targeting foster kids. So if you have families that are in poverty and addiction with kids, then you've, you've got the whole foster thing going on. And so they're in the middle of all of this for social impact finance, which I always knew was really dirty in that like it was re-harming people who've been harmed over and over and over again. But I thought it was about the money or and possibly social control. Yeah. But I think that ultimately those are the people who have more access. Yeah. To this well, I think there are different pe there are different people at different layers, and it's different <laughs> things to different people depending on the different layer that they're at. And it's not that it's not about the money; it's just it's that's a piece that's like one piece of it, but yeah. it's about so many other things. So it's not like it's it's not like oh, it's this and not well, I this think anymore. I know that I don't mean that it's not. I'm just like yeah, yeah, yeah. there's something like why is that population that yes, it's concentrated like profit center, but also just thinking about, especially the children, right? You've mm -hmm. got, you know, and, and again, being in right relationship, being in resonance with the seasons and the land and the people. And like, I think that the shamanic aspect of, you know, animist shamanism is that like, it's not, you don't have to slap a label on it and call it spiritualism or call it quantum physics. It just is how you live. It is how you are in the world. Mm -hmm. And how you are in the world is what you see here and what is beyond. And there's a fluidity about it. And you don't have to have all of these arbitrary sections the way like the rest of us do. <laughs> and I'm not, not, I mean, and again, I'm trying, I don't mean to like, I don't want to present people as a monolith, but I do think that there is something in that. And it's not just indigenous U.S. It's around the world. Like that's why they're targeting Latin America. That's why they're targeting Africa. That's why they're targeting India. People who are land-based cultures who are still have that cyclical connection. I, I think vibrationally and energetically, they, they have more facility in that. I think the future of work may be shamanic <laughs> hmm. with gig token economies. <laughs> So anyway, so that was like my next big, you know, so we've got, we find that the complex nonlinear systems guy in the next place, we're off in this distant area. And then we come across this person who's, I, we've, our paths crossed 30 years ago when I was a much different person. So that little you, sand, you can't see it very well, but that's, I pulled over to take some pictures and that there were like tons of ants. <laughs> so I had to oh. take an ant. Yeah, Amongst the sand, the there's a okay. bunch of ants. In there okay. <laughs> and so like if you stop and again um we're just talking about like the fractal nature of everything and where are we in this continuum and you know when we went to arches previously and we were looking at the soil crust and i'm like i am so amazed at this soil crust and i'm like i think maybe we're soil crust to something else like what are we soil crust to and just the enormity so you think of the universes of these ants in this tiny bit of prairie within this expanse of prairie like it just changes your perspective on everything. Like those ants of all being agents in this larger energetic field of busyness, you know, that runs this part of the prairie. And 
if you just pause and you just think about how many times are these anthills replicated across the state of, you know, Eastern Colorado and then into Kansas and, you know, just, it, it's almost overwhelming the scale when you start to think about it. Yeah, it is. Was that the, was that when you got all the burrs in your, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, right after, yeah, we turned the corner and that's the bird. But so can we show a picture of the heart that I made? So yeah. eventually the guy got away like <laughs> we had, and, and I, I, I made a heart. So the tree line in the distance, so you can see oh. the, the Tulsi, we were like, we got to get this Tulsi out first. Um, there, you can see a tree line in the far distance. So the Creek is out there. Um, and then there were some trees yeah. like in closer to the parking lot. So we just put it on the edge of the parking lot. And so we had Tulsi, that was the outline. And then, um, uh, the, I can't remember what was the name of the, the soft Mullane, the Mullane oh, leaves. Oh, yeah, yeah. The yeah, soft, yeah. silvery ones. And then um, a big dahlia in the middle and then some red dahlia petals around. And it was pretty. Yeah. yeah. So we left our good energy there. So, yeah, that was uh, the Sand Creek. And then oh, we, and did we not have, I guess, did I not talk about the Tulsi the sign? Huh? Oh, yeah, we can show this. We can show the dahlias. These are in your aunt's. Oh, I have the sign though, real quick. I, I do. I think you did get a picture of the sign here. On the drive in, we noticed that every single highway sign like that, but they were doubled, meaning there was one in front of the other, but they were like right in front, maybe a foot apart. Right so next, it wasn't yeah. like you could see them. They were literally obscuring one another. And, and it wasn't just one sign. It was like all the signs, like the street signs, the highway signs the park signs for probably like five miles. And it was, it was and, and I think that they were actually installed, like, in, which makes me wonder if like somebody got a contract and they were like, they got paid by how many signs they put in. And they just thought, well, maybe if I put in double the amount of signs, like, we can get the money. So I went to take a picture and I don't know why, I've, there's so many pictures, I, I don't know why I forgot to put that one in. But um, so I wanted to get a picture of it because it's like this weird digital twin. And in fact, later I emailed the guy to ask, I was like, do you know, why there are double signs and he like totally didn't know or he didn't really ever notice and I thought, well, that's yeah so i don't know how you could not notice because it's so but like, I, I so i jason pulled over on the side of the road and i was going to jump out and take the picture and there were these and so i was wearing because it was it was cool and i have this skirt that's like a long skirt that's wool and it's like knit wool and I hopped out of the car into the grass next to the road and these crazy burrs jumped up and stuck like all over my skirt. Like in it, like I didn't even fall down. I just kind of hopped out. And then within a couple of like 10 seconds, I was like in pain because they were going through my shoes and my, and they were hitching up my skirt and I couldn't get them out. <laughs> and, um, and later on driving down, we realized they were stuck in the tires. Like they were, and Jason has like tough, like van tires. They were stuck, not in between the treads, literally in the sidewall of the tire. These were like serious burrs. And so I had to run around and like get a change of clothes um, from these crazy burrs, which I've never experienced before. It was pretty intense. And I was trying to pick them out of my skirt and they were so sharp and painful, I could barely do it. So Jason, Jason came around with a set of tongs. <laughs> and so I sat in the front, like for the next hour, I pulled burrs out of my skirt. Um, like I changed into jeans and then I, um, I had it in my lap and I just pulled burr tongs. And then for the rest of the trip, like occasionally Jason would get poked by a burr that didn't, hadn't made it. Yeah, they, the they, they, they didn't want to leave. We, we didn't get, we, we had a hard time getting all of them. Uh, I was just looking to see if I had a picture. To, I, I, I'll i find, I I'm, I think I have pictures as well of the, the double signs. But yeah, yeah, and I know we've talked about the burrs in another map. So like, I remember on, a, on one of our other talks, we've talked about the burr situations. Maybe it was like right when we get back, but it might've been a different map. But Maybe. yeah, you would, you would think that would be right here. But yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> that was very interesting. But yeah, the the, the twinning, the, 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 the sign twinning. So I was just thinking about, you know, the digital twins, like, <laughs> yeah, as related to that. Well, it's just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, it's one of those things that, again, it didn't, and it wasn't just one of those signs. It was a lot. So, um, and did you want to talk a little bit more about that? You have a whole dot here with uh, 
Tulsi oh, and Yeah, well, Dahlia's. maybe I'll just take, uh, just briefly, uh, can I, like, um, can we show some pictures because overlap? So, yeah, so these are just the, the in situ of the dahlias before we pick them. There's a big red and white one and some purple and white ones. And um, I, I lifted the bulbs because, again, it was about to freeze. So I had a big box. And you can look at these tubers, and it's actually interesting because the tubers of the dahlias are um, used also like as a starch, like as a food source. And then I think that the tuber is also used somehow for like diabetes or insulin. So there, like so, some people grow dahlias just for the tubers, um, mm. at almost like a like a starchy yam or something like that. And in this box, you can see sort of the beefy tubers and um, from from the ones that I dug up from your aunt's garden. But the other thing that's really interesting they look about like bamboo, them, I didn't realize that they're the the shoot the They're stalks very quick. yeah it's almost like bamboo yellow. it's interesting i didn't even know yeah and um yeah here's just from better homes and gardens there there are 30 species and 20,000 cultivars of dahlias and they were originally classified as a vegetable in the 18th century um because of the tubers a mix between potatoes and radishes and let's see let's go to the next yep and they were, so they're Central American and um, it says the Dahlia pinata is the national flower of Mexico because it was first recorded in 1615. And the tubers were sent to Europe by the Spanish and the conquistadors. Um, and it says before insulin, the tubers of dahlias were used to balance blood sugar because of their high fructose content. And the petals treated dry skin infections, rashes and insect bites. Hmm. Um, and Let's see. So it would the, the original Nahuatl name. Um, oh, let me see this. Uh, a coco social, a coco social uh, comes from the word uh, ati, water, coco tree, tube, and uh, uh, social, flower, meaning flower of the hollow stem with water. And, um, and they're in Central America and they were in pre-Aztec times used for medicinally and ceremonially um, and cooked and used for medicine, the glucose stuff. And yeah, all, all in all, a very, very handy plant. And I guess they're seeing a revival in terms of like uh, cuisine using the dahlia. So, you know, to me, this is interesting using them because there are so many diabetes impact bonds now, social impact bonds around diabetes. And I do believe that these co continuous glucose monitors are going to be somehow linked to wearables and homeostasis as agents. Um, but maybe even in some of this, like, you know, if there's some sort of multiverse or interdimensional navigation, that some aspect of like maintaining our like homeostatic levels is going to be part of that. And, and actually, one of the things I put in the other map. Um, I'm trying to think <clears throat> it was about the pancreas, I guess the pancreas, it, it serves insulin and, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, there were things that were connected to schizophrenia and, um, uh, insulin uptake in the pancreas, but the pancreas is a gland. Like there's a lot of endocrinology that's linked to the mental stuff too. And, uh, Emily, uh, Moyer had told me, or had mentioned a while back about a book uh, by a, a Rosicrucian about controlling your glands and how important like that is in terms of navigating sort of spiritual spaces is control of the glands. So to me, like the pancreas, clearly there's a huge push around diabetes management, pre-diabetes management, wearable management. And um, when all maybe you need are some dahlia tubers, <laughs> that would be good enough. But so Gerta... the last thing was about color. So, you know, it said it's like 20,000. Oh, well, did you want to say something about Goethe real quick? Because you have this. Yeah. Well, so the thing is like he, so originally the first tubers came from Mexico to Spain, but Spain didn't really do that much with them. And actually, like, I think the Germans went bonkers for dahlias in terms of hybridization. And again, thinking about hybridizing and where we're looking at things with epigenetics, right? And manipulating things, not just with DNA, but with fields. Um, and the importance of optics and color in this and colored light. So I think that the dahlias were, 
are really interesting because they are known largely for being very colorful and being highly hybridized and an area of scientific interest in the color theory. Because Goethe wrote a whole book about color theory. Hmm. Um, so it said that, let's see, um, I'm just going to read this out loud because I think, I can't remember exactly what part. So um, this is an, a, a, an essay about dahlias. Johann Wolfgang, Wolfgang von Goethe, the greatest man of German literature, indeed one of the major figures of world literature, did not set out to be a gardener. No more so, uh, he aimed to become a natural scientist. Young Goethe, the offspring of a prominent Frankfurt noble house, actually planned on a law career. He also had an active interest in art, traveled widely, and developed many enduring relationships, including one with Alexander V. Humboldt an even more less permanent one with the fair sex. His first work, The Sorrows of Young Werther, was a loosely autobiographical work that made him famous practically overnight and gave birth to the Sturm und Drang movement. A prolific writer, poet, and playwright and keen observer of the political realm, Goethe was asked to come to Weimar's court by Saxon Duke Karl August in 1776. Uh, his benefactor offered the young lawyer a position as privy counselor, and the Duke arranged with him the purchase of a garden estate in nearby Frauenplan. And in time, Goethe developed good relationships with court gardeners in Dresden and Jena. His closest bond, however, was with the Skell family responsible for Karl August Belvedere Gardens in Weimar. There was a steady exchange of information and plants as Goethe thought to create his personal ideal. ideal. In the course of his botanical pursuits, the poet also espoused a theory of metamorphosis contradicting Linnae's rigid taxonomy. He aimed to find the characteristics of the primal plant and also developed a color theory that later would influence the Impressionists. He may have first seen dahlias raised by the Skells, plant inventories in Jena, uh, listed Georgina rosea and Georgina purpurea as early as 1809. Subsequent listings indicate a number of species which may have been hybrids in the court gardens. Um, anyway, so he had lots of dahlias and interested in color and interested in metamorphosis. Hmm. And so since I wrote this map, the other thing that has come to mind um, in making my maniac map uh, Sean had brought to my attention some stuff around Cleve Baxter, who is the CIA polygraph guy who was working with plant information fields. And so I'm just thinking about, again, gardens and information fields of gardens and horticulture and the idea of, you know, again, pruning, cultivating, domesticating, and sort of the energetics behind all of that and how the Goethe's color theory might play into where things are going with photonics. So I think that that last image, uh, the theory theory of colors was the book that he wrote um, in 1810, published in English in 1840. Detailed descriptions of phenomena such as colored shadows and chromatic aberration. Um, a catalog of how color is perceived in a wide variety of circumstances and considers Isaac Newton's observation to be special cases. Um, so yeah, so he was looking at color while uh, Newton was looking at the prisms and the dahlias were sort of a launching point for that. And then here I just have a little bit about Tulsi that, that it was a, you know, a holy plant, um, the threshold between heaven and earth, which is kind of actually very appropriate for mm. <laughs> the work we were trying to do. Yeah. Um, and in Hindu mythology, it's, uh, let's see, it has been used for therapeutic purposes since 5000 BCE. <laughs> Uh, claim for healing properties of the mind, body, and spirit, although it will make you sneeze <laughs> and give you a slight I headache. can attest to that. <laughs> I can definitely attest to that. At least that. the seeds will, maybe not the leaves themselves. Yeah. So yeah, okay. so that's what we were doing to make our hearts. Okay, so next we, uh, after the Sand Creek, we went out to, uh, let's go down to Amache, which is, um, they call it Granada. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so they're in, in not too far, about 45 minutes south of where the Sand Creek Massacre uh, site is in Colorado is um, Amache, which was a, um, an internment, a Japanese internment camp uh, from 1942 to 1945, over 10,000 people of Japanese ancestry. Uh, most American citizens were, had lived there. So they'd built up this little pop-up city 
and most the the buildings are all gone but the street layout is all still there and there you can see the foundations of the buildings and they have they have like rebuilt the like uh some uh i think a couple of the towers and um yeah so we stopped by there and there there were placards actually i have um there's a couple of photos that i that i pulled up here um this is this is a photo i took in back in 2011 oh, okay. Um, and, and so, yeah, and they have placards, they were making posters, you know, they had a, a print shop and they had a, they were making uh, different things for the war effort. Um, and the, a time to learn, this is a placard about the schools. So the education, you know, you've got, you've, yeah. you're, you've got to educate these, these kids to be good, uh, good citizens. So yeah, this is the, this, this is one of the stops we stopped at, um, and it was the relocation authority during World War II. Um, I think at the time it was like one of the, like oh, the tenth largest, tenth largest city, city in Colorado. City. Yeah, <laughs> like that's crazy. Like, and they built it, you know. And again, I've I've talked for quite a, some time about smart cities being the extension of Indian reservations, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I think we can also, you know, extend that to these. Um, uh, internment in camps, carceral places, right? Like these mm -hmm. internment camps, the refugee camps, these are all test beds for collectives, right? Co like managing collective processes, like enforcing certain norms, um, reconditioning people, right? Into certain ways of being through the built environment and through a standardized, regularized efficiency based system. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and what I, I wasn't fully appreciating when I, I first started talking about the smart cities and the impact investing, like clearly they were going to be nodes for these impact markets. But I think that the smart cities are literally computational interfaces. Like, and, and I would say like at this point, I'm stepping away, I'm backing off the brain center, centering and thinking more fascia. But if you imagine like, you know, it's a, a electrical grid, you know, that's a wrapping around a muscle or something like that. Like that, that these cities are going to be electrical nodes transmitting signals of the people who are the occupants of the buildings, the smart buildings. And that's what flow is probably like based, you know, on these early systems of studying, like, you, you know, that, that the people there were under observation, not just for that they didn't escape, or what have you, but to see how, what happens when you dislocate people, right? How do they remake community? How do they restore connection? How do they try to recalibrate after the trauma that they've gone through? And, and I, I have to think, knowing the centrality of cybernetics and military behavioral psychology throughout World War II, that that was baked into the assessment of these camps. Yeah, what's well, interesting, I grew up, and this wasn't the only camp in Colorado, uh, I grew up in Aurora and it was kind of like the outskirts of Aurora and it's right, literally right at the edge where all the housing and all the development stops and then it's just plain, plains. Mm -hmm. And there were two things that were out there that were, that were not too far from where I grew up, which was, there was another internment camp that we would go visit as kids. In fact, they would have like high school, you know, sometimes there'd be parties out there. You know, someone mm -hmm. would pull up with a truck with a keg and we'd hang out and drink beer and, you know, hang out. Um, but, but, and then the other thing that was out there was an abandoned, uh, a missile silo. <laughs> so yeah, okay. those are like the, the hangout spots in high school <laughs> where you could go and try to get away from the police. Although one time I was out there and the police did show up and, uh, made us all leave, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, no. So it's like, I had a, a this was in my consciousness, you know, was, I, I learned about these in high school because there was, there was literally one down the street that not a mache. Um, but there was another one that's now gone. I, th I think there's housing there now. It's it's been developed, but um, yeah. So in in town they have a museum, but we didn't make it to the museum. It was I think it was like the end of the day when we when we yeah were yeah yeah. There. I I was having a headache I think that day. So but I think I put this in just to situate it. So the town is Granada, Colorado, which is is kind of a significant name. It turns out. <laughs> I didn't know about what Granada was, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's an interesting name, imprint. Yeah, 
Um, and these aren't the best pictures. These are just me. I'm taking this probably the same picture, but yeah. Um, yeah. 10th largest city in Colorado during World War II. You know, and it's interesting, again, what I think our relationship to Japan, right? Mm -hmm. And what we did to Japanese Americans and then what, how, how those relationships went after the war, right? And the rebuilding of Japan, like with, you know, a Quaker presence there, you know, and then the, the woman who was the, the governess to the prince was a Quaker from Philadelphia. And uh, the, the remaking of post-war Japan, um, in many ways, I think to create these technologies that maybe we didn't want right under our nose here, right? And, and, and really Japan specialized a lot in, in humanoid robotics. And that was one of the things that's been really a focal point. Um, so uh, yeah, just yeah, thinking so about in the Rockefeller, I can't remember which Rockefeller was involved in Japan, but one of, one of the Rockefellers spent a lot of time in Japan and the mm -hmm. Asia Society, the overlap with the Asia Society and um, New York and Japan, like very the prominent. Cemetery. So there's the cemetery. But yeah, it was, it was an actual city, you know, they had all the different things, the schools, the, I mean, everything. And there's your so little heart. There's my little heart. They rebuilt one of the barracks and uh, a guard tower is next to it. So that's where we put another dahlia, holy basil thing, um, the blocks. I mean, it's interesting because like blockchain. it really does seem like <laughs> blockchain. Yeah. Um, and like a transistor almost, you know, or like a mechanical thing, like fitting people into like a mechanical system. Mm -hmm. And... That's the same sort of thing. I had a few uh, sunflowers that were presented themselves along the way, and I think a feather or two. And then I actually liked how that picture turned out. I think yeah, they're all ruffled guys, but the, the the sun going down behind the. Uh... Yeah, it's a good shot. So, do I have something that talks a little bit about the the Granada? Yeah, the, yeah, um... you do. Yeah, so it's um yeah, so it's in Granada, um, and I think so. I think we covered all of that. This particular one. Um, uh, do, do we talk about Granada? I think we've mostly, um, okay. So, oh, well, I guess Granada is the name of the pomegranate. I guess maybe I forgot to. Like, yeah, we have, we haven't got, we haven't gone over this part. Yeah. So the, the, um, so when I looked up Granada, cause I was thinking Granada, Spain and then, um, but it, it actually is named after the, the pomegranate. And at the time I've, I've actually been dealing sort of navigating a lot of space around mythology because as strange as it is, I feel like the future of computation somehow involves our soul and live action role play. <laughs> and um, like lately, you know, in terms of navigating stuff with my child, who's, you know, been distanced from me, I, I somewhat like empathize with Demeter. And so I don't know if, if people aren't familiar with the Greek myth, um, but the pomegranate is associated with Persephone and um, Demeter was the, the, goddess of agriculture and like the harvest and her daughter Persephone um w like went out with some other girls and they were picking flowers and the god Hades of the underworld um cast his eyes on her and fell in love with her and swept her away to the underworld and um and her mother didn't know what happened to her and no one knew where she was and um and then ultimately um there was a negotiation made because Demeter was so sad and she was the goddess of the harvest that there was a famine, like all the, the harvest failed and, and they couldn't have that continue. So they negotiated th that Persephone would be able to spend a certain amount of the year above ground with her mother. And then that would be the spring. And then when she had to go to the underworld in the winter, then she would be with Hades. But part of the reason that she couldn't just leave was that she had eaten something underground and what she was given was a pomegranate. So um, it says, th this is from a, 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 a paper. It says the pomegranate plays a prominent role in the hymn to De Demeter, which came into popularity with the cult of Demeter in U U Eleusis. <laughs> um, the beginning of the myth deals with the kidnap and rape of Persephone followed by her mother Demeter's search for her. Uh, she leaves Olympus and wallows in agony among the mortals, finally stopping in Eleusius disguised as an old woman. Hermes, again, we're back to Quicksilver and Mercury. Hermes finds her there and goes to retrieve Persephone as ordered by Zeus. 
Unbeknownst to everyone else, Persephone had eaten a pomegranate seed given to her by Hades. Partaking of food in the underworld meant she could not leave permanently. Final negotiations between the Olympians eventually settled that Persephone would spend two thirds of the year in Olympus with her mother and the other third with Hades in the underworld. Um, so after that, um, pomegranate was associated with slavery and subjection, which is kind of an interesting choice given the internment camp, right? Um, and there, there is a hint of malicious intent since Hades used the pomegranate as a love spell or a charm to trick her. Um, it says Myers argues that Hades anointing himself with the pomegranate and making physical contact with her bound Persephone to him, recalling the fruit's efficacy in marriage contracts. The phrase not only escaped the notice of the reader, but the notice of Persephone who realized she was under a spell of a sort later on when she was with her mother and felt a sense of longing towards her husband. So that's interesting. Again, yeah, the whole idea of the contract and like the hidden contract, right? Yeah. Or the tricky contract or the secret contract or even like stigmergic or pheromonal. Like it's not exactly, but the sense, there's a chemosensory aspect to that, a binding with a chemosensory element. So that's pretty interesting, Jason, yeah, is. I think, you know, and, and the, these myths. And so, um, and then the other thing is it says, um, so why is the pomegranate the symbol of Granada, Spain? Um, it is that the uh, Catholic kings are responsible for the name. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella chose the fruit as the symbol of their final victory over the Moors at, of An Andalus, which took place in Granada. The fruit is originally from Iran and Afghanistan, but brought to Spain by the Phoenicians. So that's kind of an interesting, you've got some conquistador stuff going on there. You've got, you know, our Columbus and, you know, discovery of the new world. You have Iran and Persia, Phoenicians. Um, and then it says, uh, in, in sim symbolically in mythology, often the pomegranate sim signifies life and rebirth, fertility and abundance. Um, and it's in other parts of the world. In Korea, it is said that pomegranates can purge hatred and envy. And it says, in holy scriptures, it suggests pomegranate could have been the real forbidden fruit in the story of Adam and Eve. In the Buddhist tradition, the pomegranate is one of three blessed fruits alongside citrus and peach and known for curing evil habits. Um, pomegranate significance is the belief that each fruit contains exactly 613 seeds in keeping with the 613 commandments of the Torah, making the pomegranates a sacred fruit with a sacred number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, what, it's what it, it wrapped up a lot of religions. Yeah. Well, what was interesting about this, it says, okay, it's birth and life, but also, uh, you know, subjugation, <laughs> subjugation. And then also <laughs> like, uh, it had to do with, um, a contraceptive, uh, you know, as a contraceptive as well. So, it, 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 yeah, it, yeah, there was something about it being a contraceptive, which is interesting. It says, um, uh, soreness is contraceptive methods. Get your hands on a pomegranate. According to the Greek gynecologist, women should grind the inside of a fresh pomegranate peel, add water, and apply it to their vagina. To make this contraceptive method more complex, Soranus offers an alternative recipe, such as two parts pomegranate peel to one part oat gall a large growth on a tree caused by a certain type of insect and equal parts pomegranate peel with rose oil and gum. After inserting the pomegranate internally, women should always follow with a drink of honey water. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, so this there was, this was, you know, so the pomegranate thing led you to, um, yeah. So well, I think and, I heard and Lynn seen... Resnick. Well, I, we had, I, so in a different part of the map, I had the Resnicks there. I'm going to, I'll pull connected. that out. I, yeah, they're, they're connected to a piece of artwork we saw at the end of the trip. Um, and so when I, I thought, huh, Palm, like I happened to look up that name. And so Stuart and Linda Resnick are, um, they own a lot of land in the Central Valley in California and they grow almonds and oranges, but also pomegranates. And um, so it says uh, they own Palm Wonderful, P-O-M Wonderful, which is a pomegranate drink. Uh, which is one of their main products. And so they're like a many times over billionaire and very wealthy and controlling a lot of farmland in California. And so pomegranates are kind of central to that story. Um, and I have, there's a picture of the pomegranate bottle. If, I'm sure people recognize it. Yeah. Different kinds of palm blend juices. Yeah, definitely. So this can lead down to, I mean, there's this, there's diverting paths here. 
Uh, but it all, it all circles back around. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so that, that led you uh, toward the end of the trip. We have this interesting sculpture and I think we've talked a little bit about it, but you know, in color in, in Denver, people don't really pay much attention. There's an area near I-25 and Broadway that was, it was like built in the eighties as like a design center. So there was like a bunch of businesses related to, um, like home decor and, and design you know, home design, things like that. Like, and so, but there's a, there's a, there's a several sculptures there. And one in particular is this really weird yellow, uh, like, um, like wave sculpture. It's, it's pretty large. I mean, you could see it from the highway when you drive by. Um, and so like most people in Denver, it's, it's almost like a joke. Like people don't really, and I've lived it's here not my a whole joke. life. I think it's like probably chaos magic or something. No, no, I'm, I'm just saying most people's perception. No, I know, people, most people do, yeah. People don't really take it that seriously. And not, like most people don't really think that much about it. It's, it's just not like, like this... a big French fry or something, you know. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah, there's a whole bunch well, of different Jason, names do for it. you know what's really interesting on the color that I just realized? Because I've been, this color yellow is, is um, it's like chromium yellow mm. is throughout um Maniac. So if you mm. go back and watch Maniac, you'll see a lot of this color yellow in it, which is kind of noticeable because like yellow isn't a super common color like these days, maybe back in the 70s more so. And um, so when I was looking into the alch alchemy stuff that the, um, the chromium yellow was equated to sulfur, I believe, and the soul. So mm. it's like a soul situation. It's mm. literally like a soul frequency. Yeah. That yellow. Interesting. Which is interesting when we think about it. Yeah. So anyways, we were driving by and Allison's like, what's that? I was like, oh, that's just. No, we were in the Home Depot parking lot. You're like, oh, look over there. I oh, have that's to right. That. Oh, yeah. So this yeah. is very near. This is very near uh, the location of the radium. Uh, the, the radium Institute, I think is what it was. Yeah. Uh, so we were trying to find, it's not there anymore. The building's not there anymore, but we were trying to figure out where it was. So this is just like right on the other side of the train tracks from where we were. There's now a Home Depot where the Radium Institute is. But Allison was asking about this. I'm like, well, I can drive over there. Let's go, let's yeah. go take a closer like, let's look. Let's go look closer. And I've never even like driven, like I've never been up like close to it. You know, I've just, it's just something that's been in Denver. We forever. had to drive kind of far around because it was along the railroad tracks. Yeah. You had to go around the, the railroad. So Allison's got a whole thing here. I don't know if you want to go into the, like the wave and all that. Maybe we'll do that the next time. Yeah. Maybe on but anyway, so we can, we might, we'll probably loop back around to this, but this relates to um, that couple, Stuart it raised, and Lynn. Essentially it relates to particles and waves. So for people who are listening and not looking, essentially it's it's like if you had a massive like 30 foot high sculpture that was like the proportions of an index card like a rectangle but they're made of like almost like oscillating jenga blocks that are pivoting on top of each other that are made out of concrete and it's bright yellow and if you look at it from forward it's interesting because it's actually like the bentov like the stalking the wild pendulum how you understand it depends on what your perspective is so if you look at it forward it's wide and it has these alternating ripples because of the jenga, jenga blocks but if you look at it along the narrow side you see the wave you, you see the just the skinny bit going wiggling up and down like a like a sine wave um and so Again, I've been doing this Maniac TV show and a lot of it is about putting people in a hypnagogic state and putting them into sort of a multiverse existence. And two of the characters, their storylines keep overlapping in their dream state. And they have these all of these dials and things that show these uh, ripple effects of like their individual profiles overlapping and like heterodyning. And so I think that that's sort of what this sculpture represents because at every dip, on one side of the sculpture is the hill on the other. So they like cancel each other out. It's like a noise canceling thing. And this guy, um, Herbert Bayer, who was the artist, he was essentially the in-house artist for both Arco, Atlantic Richfield Oil, and then um, for uh, the Aspen Institute, which is the Aspen Institute is sort of a central player in a lot of this stuff um, about um, policy around impact investing and all of the things that are coming are coming out of it. so he was the in-house person for both of these and we'll we'll talk about it a little bit more but um there was a, an exhibit uh, of his work a retrospective at the aspen institute and the funding was for this was provided by the resnick family 
Yeah. So, so that's, that's, what yep. that's that why I was trying way. to bring that back to the Resnick. Yeah. So, Over to I, the pomegranate yeah. water. People. Well, another thing about this too, is it's, it's, they're stacked. And I know like, they always talk about the stack in the blockchain, the blo these blockchain stacks, oh, these layers, yeah, the stacks. Right. And I think I that's that. really relevant. The, the, the stack, it's all about the stack. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. Um, and yeah, a cycle, so, right? The Dewey stuff that we've been talking about periodicity and intervals. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so Stuart and Linda Resnick, you know, California citrus uh, nuts. And we, you were, we and I were having a conversation the other day about, about them. And, and I, you know, I know you had brought up some stuff on this map about, um, the, their, their water usage. And, yeah. um, and so there was a lot of controversy. I knew about this going back. This is actually from a mother Jones article that I probably, I'm pretty sure I read when it first came out, uh, mm -hmm. and about just kind of like the, the concerns about their water usage and saying that, you know, these, these are very water intensive plants and they're pulling water away from other areas. And so, you know, me being, oh yeah, we need to, we need to do something about that. But then you, I come to realize, like, I, I just kind of did a search, uh, a blockchain and water. And, and so there was an article that can, had come out here about, uh, you know, how they want to legislate. There's some news legislation in California that was coming out last year to deal with water rights. And then in reading the article. In I, the I West, I mean, water rights are such a big deal. Like in the East Coast, we don't know so much about that. But. Yeah, yeah. It's a very big deal out here. Uh, every, you know, even here in Colorado, like where we were in the, the, the Colorado River, there were like major, there have been major fights over the, the, the water down at the um, San Luis Valley. So anyways, I was reading this and it says, oh, in the article, it says, oh, we need to digitize. We need to digitize everything. So then I looked up. Oh, is there anything uh, dealing with, you know, blockchain based, yeah. you know, and so I found a bunch of articles related to blockchaining, uh, water rights and, and, and just, this is from the world economic forum, how to distribute, uh, ledger technology. Right. Problem reaction solution. Yeah, right. exactly. So yeah, these are some interesting blockchain is overhyped, but it's perfect for California's drought problem. Um, so yeah, these are just a bunch of articles that I, that I'd come up with, um, dealing with that. So well, I, I want to mention a little bit on the, the water, because it's interesting looking at the image of the, those monocrop farms, right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Cleve Baxter's work in plant intelligence and like the information fields of plants. Cause the idea like within having him having polygraphs on plants is that they were sensing and that they could sense things in their environment, like even at a distance and they could sense things that were harmful and it would react and it would show on the um, a polygraph. Um, and so I'm thinking about the agriculture and the shift to smart agriculture and what it will, how it will interface with plant sensing, like fields of plants sen sensing one another because that's a thing and um, and, it's an, and it's a natural thing, but then also how this fits in with like soil science and the nanotech and the crop insurance that Leo has been looking at, the parametric crop insurances and the water, blockchain water. Because what I can see is it's always problem reaction solution is, you know, they're talking about, you know, coming up with high efficiency irrigation, right? Like with sensors that know exactly precisely how many drops at which thing and which plant but then each of those plants that's put on a smart sensor is also being bathed in its own energetic frequency attached to the sensor systems that are tied to the irrigation. And then all of that frequency based is also structuring the water a certain way that's going through those pipes. And so when you're talking about smart water, like where does that overlap with structured water and water programming? And eventually we're gonna get around to talking about it with Lynn some about Dallas, but you know, the new smart water infrastructure and how that's going to overlap with sort of where we are with like how water interfaces with our biology, both our biology, plant biology, the soil, these, the liquid crystal of water. I mean, to me, it's, it's very complex and the narrative of, um, you know, the climate narrative as it is about carbon trading and blockchain and all this stuff is so limited, like, beyond what's actually happening right? when on that like Stuart resnick he's you know like in this this company that many would are many environmentalists would argue it 
is is very destructive yet he's also a major investor in his philanthropy he's invested you know 750 million endowment to caltech for climate research you know? and neuropsychiatric hospital look at that yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Bless Excuse you. me. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, we're talking like, these are things you keep bumping up against. And while there's part of me that would prefer to never have to think about like spiritualism and parapsychology and channeling, and it all feels kind of ridiculous. Like you can't really set aside that this seems to be about consciousness and it seems to be about frequency. And it seems to be about like a game that's being played at high levels by people, systems, I don't know, that we just do not understand. Hmm. Yeah, and I also noticed too, he was uh, he was on the board of- he, he made the money, his money from the Franklin Mint. He bought the Franklin oh, Mint, isn't right, that crazy? Yeah, yeah, and it's not an actual mint, but if you probably- it's like you, collectible. It, it, yeah, I, I remember all the commercials in like the 90s and the 80s and 90s about the, the little model cars or, you know, they had little coins and they had like collectibles. Yeah. So I, I, you know, they always had infomercials or maybe not infomercials, but like more extended, longer commercials. Uh, oh yeah. Think. And you said he was on the board of Leapfrog, which was like more impact. Yeah. So Leapfrog, we haven't really talked too much about Leapfrog, but they make uh, baby monitors and they have like little tablet things for kids. So it's like learning toys. They have regular just plastic toys, but they have a lot of learning. It's, it's a lot I of feel it's... bad. I think I might have bought some Leap. <laughs> so leapfrog that. enterprises he's not on the board anymore but he was on the board there as well so there was probably another uh thing where is it based oh the uh oh shoot you know what i just closed the dang window That's hold okay. on I'll, i can bring it back up uh i'll look it up yeah so they they're they're an important couple <laughs> Yeah, very, very important. And Aspen Institute is really central. Like when I was back doing Little Sis, I had so many entries for Aspen Institute. Oh, Emeryville, California, Emeryville. Oh, okay. Makes sense. But yeah, get your... Yeah, get all the kids plugged in. Giving their consciousness to the machine. Little channels. <laughs> so sad. It is. Yeah. Human energy. Epic human energy. Yeah. So anyway, so I thought that was relevant to um, the the leapfrog, even though it was just kind of a little blip. He was he was on their board. Um, I'm not sure when when to win. 2002 to 2005. So yeah, they. Uh, what else do we have here? Um, just more about the Resnicks. Oh yeah, harvesting health and happiness. Wonderful. Like that's interesting when you think about wellness and some of that stuff, like the, the languaging of joy and wholeness and happiness. Um, uh, yeah, paradigm changing work in community engagement, health, wellness, and education. So that looks like impact investing to me. It's also halos, those little oranges, which I actually kind of like those little oranges. But yeah, yeah. We, we, ate, we ate a bunch of them on the road, actually. <laughs> I know, maybe we were channeling uh, the rest I, I, of I, I bought some for our road trip. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the Aspen Institute, again, that sculpture was tied to the Aspen Institute. Well, the, the, art, the artist, like the he, artist he was, was the in-house artist, yeah, the for in -house, Aspen yeah. Institute. And then Linda, I mean, they're both billionaires in their own right. It's not like they're a billionaire couple. Oh, and so... Yeah, she was telling like so I think I think Steffers brought my attention to the fact that her um father that Linda Resnick's father is Jack Harris and she was a film distributor. He was a film distributor in the 50s known for producing the blob. The blob, yeah, the, <laughs> the stuff. The blob, and you think about the whole slime mold thing, right? So yeah. the blob. I'm going to I'm gonna have to rewatch the blob. And, you know, in the blob, like one of the scenes of the blob, it was actually filmed in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. outside of Philadelphia. Hmm. Um, so, and look, and so she, the Horn and Hard Art Children's Hour. So Horn and Hard Art was the automat with the little, it was like a cafeteria where all the food was in little like containers and you would put a quarter in and open the door. That was the automat, like hard and oh. hard. I guess that's a TV uh, show. There's a new documentary out to, about the automat that was... It's oh, yeah. made. It's made by um, uh, Mel Brooks' daughter, and uh, so it's like and, and Mel Brooks is interviewed. A bunch of people are talking about the old automats in New York, where you, it was just a business you would go into, uh -huh. and it was just a whole bank of. It's kind of an interesting documentary, but 
but yeah, the auto mat, like, because I guess they're, they say that they're, they're, they're making a comeback or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, now, this is interesting about the Pentagon Papers and her. Oh, yeah. Like, so Daniel, she, she was friends with Daniel Ellsberg. Yeah, I guess she was dating, dating an engineer at Rancorp. And so he, he, she let him use her copy machine at her ad agency to copy the Pentagon paper stuff. Yeah, it says yeah. she was a an unindicted co-conspirator for her role, uh, which I support. The Pentagon papers coming out, so it's you know it's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting. Like you, you, it, it does make you wonder though on all of these things coming out, like. How much of it is it comes out because it's supposed to come out like it's time for that to come out you know or it advances the game in some way mm, like the yeah. releases right like there's probably lots of stuff that never comes out you know right and what comes out when it comes out like the, the more you 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 wade in these waters the more you realize that this information flow is like so much of it is about curating the flow right like there are things that are allowed to come out at certain points because they actually advance yeah, I think there's a lot of that for sure. Okay, well, I think that's that's probably a good stopping point. Next time we'll go into, we went into Dodge City, so we can talk a little bit about the whole mythology and the gambling around all of that. The gambling. Which is very yeah. interesting. Um, another auditorium, another stage. and um, Exactly. But we did know, do a trip. And we get into it. Yeah, and, and well, we, and we got out of Colorado. Like, but once we get into Can uh, the Dodge City, that'll be Kansas. And then we only had yeah. one stop in Kansas. And we're in Oklahoma. And as we go through this, you'll see that whole, that very long s segment, it'll, it'll start to make sense why there was all this, this setup before we just started talking. Why we talking. front loaded it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It'll start to yeah. make sense. But again, the synchronicity of those two things, like of crossing paths with someone I hadn't seen for 30 years in this remote, out, like two different remote outposts of the National Park Service, where I was at a completely different head spaces of like the 24 year old version of me versus the 54 year old version of me, you know? Yeah. And then, um, you know, the previous, the nonlinear systems modeling guy. So, you know, yeah. and that's what I'm really interested in is like, what is, what are the things that we can change? What, what is this emergent system? And are there things energetically we can do that get us towards a better outcome for ourselves or the people we care about or the world, you know? Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks, Allison. Uh, yeah, we're yeah. we're we're gonna we're gonna get through this uh, this whole map eventually. Uh, eventually. And uh, but it's uh, yeah, I, it was a, it was a fun trip, and um, yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll... Thanks for people who are still interested. <laughs> 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 exactly. We'll have to do the the condensed version, but it's all relevant. Like all 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 of these little pieces. Well, again, some of this maniac stuff, the stuff I'm researching now, like it folds back in and gives broader perspective. So yeah, it's hard because it is like it's like, oh, we're talking about this and now we're talking about this over here. And it's not always apparent how these two things connect. <laughs> so um but they do. So you we'll have um, to have a lot of bandwidth. Exactly. But and it also just spending time with it. You know, it's like I, I always have people like send me the five minute version. I'm like, you can't do the five minute version. Like, I, I'm not even done with it. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah. it, it, when you spend more time with it, like a lot of these terms that like a lot of people that might be just jumping on right now, that are like watching our videos for the first time, they're not right. used to hearing a lot of the terms that are now part of our regular vernacular. So, right. you know, once you spend time with it, all of a sudden it'll start to be like, oh, okay, I know what you're talking about. Um, but it just, it takes a while to familiarize yourself with the landscape that you're, you know. Well, and I feel like our stuff is, it's sort of um, like, there's a certain person out there who, when they find this kind of take on the information, it resonates and then they just want to know more and more. You know what I mean? Like they, it's, it's something that, fits, right? It's the thing they've been looking for, right? Mm -hmm. And so then they just binge on a lot of material. But there's some people who are like, if you're just sampling us from among another 20 different influencers or whatever, like you're not really ever going to get there, which is okay. You don't have to, but yeah. like, like we're kind of a pretty niche market of people, like people who are at a certain level who, for whom this story makes sense to them. Right, And then there's just a lot of other people that it's not going to make sense or there's not worth the time commitment. To but it's sure. helpful to be able to recognize, um, okay, these are different stories. A lot of, I yeah. think a lot of times people don't realize that we're telling a different story 
and they're trying to incorporate it into this other story and not realizing that they're that they're incompatible like you can't yeah. you can't think of the world like that, that this is the way things are and this as well they're just they're they're incongruent uh, and that's okay i mean if you if you like think this other story makes sense that's fine but it's very useful to understand the differences between the story uh and and having that inform on your decision about you know what makes I mean, sense. I'm still like knocking heads with people about the authoritarian stuff, clearly. Like that's such a, and, and, and again, I'm not saying that there will never be any phases of authoritarianness in this, right? But I'm, what I'm trying to make very clear is that the Brave New World versus 1984, like maybe you just call Brave New World authoritarian, right? I'm not, I'm making a distinction that, that, that one is, you know, or you could say one is the Iron Fist and one is the Velvet Glove or, you know, something like that. But that, and they're 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 both control mechanisms. But the, the nature of that control is different, and it matters that it's different. Um, you're not going to if you're framing the token economy as fascism, you're not going to understand that it actually is being set up as like indigenous anarchist commoning or libertarian commoning. Yeah. Like if if you want to believe that 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 that, that, that it's fascism, you're going to have a really hard time telling, you know anarcho-capitalists that what they're doing is is authoritarian like it's just it's yeah well it's i think it, i think fascism is a piece of it because it's, like, it's polarity right it needs you know the it, it wants that that push and pull it wants those spin you know so it'll well, it it's, needs it's people not to like, think that that's that it's fascism like i think but i think in and of itself i think there is a distinction between a, a game that people willingly for the most part participate in and something that is coercive and punitive. Like yeah. to me, those are foundationally different frames of what's happening. Do you believe that the majority of what we're walking into is going to be harm, like painfully punitive the whole time, right? And a lot of people do still, or do you believe that actually another big piece is that people will willingly play the game? And like, based on what I'm hearing, if this is accurate about Mercola and beyond this fact that if he's sick, which I, you know, I certainly don't want anyone to be unwell, but if he is like shifting his business model to channeling interdimensional beings and doing a book deal, well, then he's like a huge person in this wellness space. Right. And so then like, to me, that's pulling bunches of people into all of that. Like that's, they're willingly all participating in the good hat crypto supplement business. And yeah. to think that that's not part of the game, like that's, to me, that's, I would like for people to understand that that's an equivalent part of the game and that many people are playing that game willingly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably, probably, you know, like, in, and I'm sure we're in the game too, like in, a, in ways we're playing it willingly. There's a puzzle, we're trying to solve it, we're doing it publicly, we're playing the game willingly. But it is an authoritarian structure that's making us do it. We've chosen to do it. Yeah. So I, I think it's a worthwhile consideration because to limit it to the Iron Fist version or to say everything has to be slotted in under the Iron Fist version actually doesn't let you get at the nuance of what it is. Yeah. And and I and again I don't think you have to get rid of the Iron Fist thing altogether. I think that's that is there and it's going to play a role. It, but it's But only... most of the people who are arguing with me are not doing it saying like Right. I see your point that it will vacillate between the two points. Right. They in, continue to insist that it that's is authoritarian. All, that's all that it, it is. is fascism. Yeah. That yeah, I'm calling what you just said over there fascism. Like, fine. Yeah. If that's how you need to think about it, okay. Then this right. isn't the place for you here. And that's fine. I'm not, you know, like, there's plenty of other places you could do that. Substack is littered with those places. Go there and do that there. That's not what we're doing over here. Yeah. So, like, I see the vacillation. I see the, the need to alternate. But I, I don't see a lot of people online talking about it like that at this point. It's still yeah, very, agree. very narrow and limited. And that's not what we're doing over here. Yeah, it's a so. different, different approach or different. Um, well, anyway, so yeah, well, thanks again for everyone for joining us. And as you can see from the map, uh, we are on number two or number three we've gone through one two three <laughs> and <laughs> so we're we picking have, up steam it'll go faster we have many many more to go but yeah uh thanks again and until next time bye